Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The time is 6 o'clock p.m. Uh, we are required by the city charter of Pontiac, established by you, the people of Pontiac, Michigan, uh, that we have the mayor or deputy mayor present for the meeting to begin. So once we have one of those two community leaders, then I'll call the meeting to order. When the meeting is started, if you could please use either of the side exits, so that way when somebody is speaking, they don't have to contend with what sometimes can be a loud door, but also the visual of somebody passing in and out behind them. Please put your phone on silent or vibrate as well. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This meeting of your Pontiac City Council is hereby called to order for Tuesday, August 30th, 2022. The time is 6.02 p.m. Uh, first, I'm going to start uh, a practice here where we're prompting a question for each city council member as we start. If you could, colleagues, please share a motivating factor for why you're involved in the Pontiac community. So if you could just share one of the reasons of what drives your service in Pontiac. And I know I didn't prep you for that question, uh, but I'll start with the Honorable Councilman William Parker, Jr. <laughs> what drives my service is having stayed in Pontiac for over 15 years and watching and listening and being involved in the community. Oh, sorry, didn't have a mic on. Having been involved in Pontiac for as long as I have and, and just watching that what's been going on in Pontiac. I thought I had a skill set that would be of use to those in the community. And so I am here to see a need, meet a need, and serve the community. Thank you. Councilwoman Kathleen James. Uh, what drives me is uh, just my faith and, and my hope in the Pontiac community. I love the community, have been here a very long time. 
And uh, I just believe that we can be so much more than what we are. And I believe that we can really propel our youth and our young people uh, to go so much further than where they are. So that's it's hope, faith, hope, charity. Thank you. Pro Tem William Carrington. Uh, thank you, President McGinnis. I want to keep this very sweet and short. What drives me is the love for people and community. And I continue to want to make, uh, to be a part of making sure this city is one of the greatest cities in America. Thank you. Councilman Melanie Rutherford. Um, it's because I love the city and it's a debt I owe. The city raised me, saved me, and helped raise my daughter. So it's a debt that I'll pay every weekly, good, bad, or indifferent. It's where I'm from. It's where I am. It's what I breathe. It's Pontiac. Councilman Brett Nicholson. Uh, I've always been driven by opportunity, and I see something that is exciting or um, that there's a lot of value that could, could, could be there. I know that we've had so many opportunities we've missed and so many opportunities that other people have not taken for us that I felt like I, I wanted to make sure that I lended my voice to make sure that we always took advantage of those opportunities. Councilman Mikhail Goodman. Uh, to keep it really like a buck 98, um, I've lived in the city my entire life. I grew up uh, in Section 8 housing on food stamps. And to have the opportunity to be able to make some real change for people who look like me, who come from the same background as me, and to be able to actually do that, I am uh, jumping at the opportunity to do so, and I'll keep doing it. And thank you. Good evening. I'm Mike McGinnis, uh, Councilman for District 7. Uh, a, a big driving factor for me is my father. He's a Pontiac resident uh, and first came to the city when he graduated college to work at Pontiac General Hospital, then owned by the city of Pontiac. Uh, but he suffers from mental illness and had a number of manic episodes in the 70s, 80s, and 90s uh, and was institutionalized at a state hospital that stood in Pontiac but is there no longer, most recently called the Clinton Valley Center. And uh, as somebody who is uh, had a very formative um, impact on my upbringing. He, for his entire adult life, has loved Pontiac, has lived here for decades, and really inspired and motivated me when I was younger to look at Pontiac uh, through the eyes of what's possible, as well as uh, the splendor and history and majesty uh, that has come before us as well. So that's one of the driving motivating factors for me and, and why I put the time in. With that, we are now at invocation. Councilman Parker, if you could introduce this evening's invocation. Actually, it says it's Councilman. All right, go for it. Councilman yeah. James. Yes. Uh, tonight's uh, invocation will be given by Bishop Teresa Lee. Uh, Bishop Lee is an internationally renowned uh, pastor and uh, faith-based leader uh, in this uh, country, in this city, and we are very happy to have her on tonight. Uh, following her invocation, uh, we would like for her to remain at the uh, podium because we want to be able to read a tribute in her honor. Thank you. To God be the glory. Thank you for this opportunity and this privilege to be among our community and our fellow friends and city councils and our mayor. Can we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, we come to you, first of all, thanking you for who you are in our life. Thanking you, God, that you have purposed us for such a time as this. Father, we thank you that we know without a shadow, without every person that's in this room, every, our leaders, our city council, our mayor, before the foundation of the world, it was already predestinated that we would be in such a time as this. So, God, we thank you that we are privilege to have this opportunity to obey you. Father God, we pray since that, I pray now that those that in leadership, that you would give our leaders wisdom, that they will may be able to do the things beyond their understanding. Father, I pray that you help them to choose the right path when making decisions on behalf of this community. Give, give our uh, mayor grace and courage to make sound decisions that will line up with the will and for this community. I pray, God, in Jesus' name that we come against anything in this community that will lead to disorder, unrest, 
We prayed that as citizens we would recognize the authority and obey it, even when we don't agree with certain things. Help us to use peaceful and legal means to address issues that concern us. We pray against those who are working to stir up trouble and violence and to bring harm to our government, to our nation, to our community. Father, we come against it. We pray, Father, that we will learn how to work together as one. Give the spirit of peace to our hearts. Glory be to God that we would know how to help one another to live in a peaceful and quiet life. God, I pray right now in Jesus name, glory be to God that the peace of love that would destroy the spirit of chaos. May the words that come from our mouth be the words that edify our community, our nation. God, that it will edify our city. May we find peace within the borders of this community in the name of Jesus. God, we give your name glory and we thank you in advance for what you're doing, how you are beautifying this community. And even with the confession that was just made with our city council, God, we believe it. And we pray now because of that confession, we believe, glory be to God, that this community will be the community that you have called before the foundation of the earth. Every plan of every evil plan or uh, uh, evil device that would come against any of our leaders, anyone that's in authority, Father God, we arrest it now in Jesus' name. So God, we thank you and we praise you now. We give your name glory, Father, we give your name honor. Glory be to God, because you have already predestinated this. It's already been carved out, my God, today before time. And we thank you again that the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding will lead and guide us into a place, glory be to God, where the grassroots people that voted for this, my God, today it will come to pass. We thank you for the spirit of peace. It will come to pass in the mighty name of Jesus. So God, we give your name glory again. And we give your name honor again. And we thank you in advance for what you're doing. Protect our leaders. Because they're here to protect us. In Jesus' name. Thank God. And amen. Lee, Councilman James. Amen. Uh, Bishop Lee, on behalf of the city of Pontiac, uh, we want to, uh, you are a strong and a passionate leader in the faith based community here in Pontiac, serving as uh, the pastor of the New Birth International Church and the first woman to serve as the vice president of the Oakland County Ministerial Fellowship. And so much, you have done so much more. And so, on in your honor, the city council wishes to acknowledge a tribute to you. Uh, we want to acknowledge uh, uh, that you, uh, your, the celebration of your 17th pastoral anniversary. Uh, we want to express our gratitude for the many years of servant leadership that you have provided to this community. And we want to uh, express our gratitude to the New Birth International Church congregation for sharing Bishop Lee with the Pontiac community. In tribute, the City Council wishes uh, Bishop Lee and the New Birth International Church the very best as you mark your 17th pastoral anniversary. Uh, this tribute, it has all of the names of the seven council people as well as our mayor, Tim Grimel. And, you know, we just really want to say that we want to thank you so much for all the wonderful work that you have done. And we want to uh, wish you the best uh, 17th anniversary celebration. And thank you for being a blessing to the city of Pontiac. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so very much. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I speak? Now that you've gotten a Chuck Johnson handshake, yes. Okay. Thank you. You, you know, it, it's certainly a privilege and an honor to stand here before our community and uh, to be recognized. So much hard work in leadership is, is beyond measures and what you can even think or even imagine. But I thank our city council, I thank our mayor, and certainly I thank the New Birth International Church. But, 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 but rather, if this resolution is for me, I, 
you know, you know I'm just a servant, just doing a job. But, but I believe that none of this could ever happen if we didn't have committed people. And we have some committed people. We, we, it's not a mega church, you know. But we have committed people that strive to be one. Everything that happens at new birth, it happens because our people. It have, happens because we have collaborated with our, with our Oakland County. We have collaborated with the city. And all of this bring resources to our community. And, and I just want to just take the time and ask those of New Birth International Church, instead of me receiving this, I think they deserve it far more greater than that. Because you know what? I couldn't do this without them at all. It takes a, you know, they use, they, they say, uh, 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 there's an old token that says it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to do whatever you want to do. We can never think and ever engraft in your mind that you can do this on your own. You need somebody. And I want to thank the New Birth International Church. I want to thank our city council and our mayor. I want to thank our Oakland County, uh, com the Oakland County, because they have been very supportive to us. I just want to thank everybody. But I just want our people here to stand up and just let me just give this to them. And we just continue to do what we've been doing. God bless. And thank our city. Thank our community. We're one. Man, when we get this, that we all in this thing together as one, what can we do? What impact can we make in this city? I'm working with the community. I'm working with our city council. I'm working with our mayor. They're working with us. If we work together instead of fighting one another, it'll be a, it'll be a test that God will look down and say, servant, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Thank you, uh, uh, Councilwoman Kathy James. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you. God bless much. you. Again, thank you so very much. This belongs to you can all. You, you take it to me? All right. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Have a beautiful Thanks again. Now please rise for a Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. We'll remain standing. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That's not true. Apologies, just had to make sure the display worked for us. Since we last met, our community has lost a number of names. Those are the individuals that we know of and that have been submitted to us, but we know that it extends beyond just these listed individuals. We pause now to remember James Baylor, K. Ann Beauchamp Hughes, Angel Bermudez, also went by Manuel, Nancy Bledsoe, Raymond Breeding, Venetia Daniels, Bernice Ellsworth, Madeline Evans Tinsley, Sandra Fed, Leisha Green, Harry Haig, Willie Leith, Virginia Livadoti, a nurse for over 30 years with St. Joseph Mercy and uh, Pontiac Osteopathic Hospital, Melan, also known as Snoopy or Junior, Arthur Scales, Barry Shuren, 37 years at GMC Truck and Bus, Shaquindra Smith, Sean Swanson, sometimes known as Swanee Swanson, Dorothy Taylor, Erica Thompson, Raymond Tucker, Patricia Wardlow, very active with the VFW on Cesar Chavez, and Gregory Jody Wheeler. Please join us for a moment of silence for them and those in your lives and in your neighborhoods as well. Thank you. You may be seated. Roll call. Clerk Doyle.
Harrington? Uh, present. Goodman? Here. James? Here. McGinnis? Present. Nicholson? Here. Parker? Here. Rutherford? Present. Mr. President, you have a quorum. Quorum being established and all members present in voting, we now are at the motion to approve the agenda. Is there such a motion? So Move by Carrington. It has been moved by Pro Tem Carrington and seconded by Councilman Goodman uh, that we approve this evening's agenda. That's the motion before us. Uh, now what I'd like to do is show you uh, some amendments that I know of. And just to confirm, uh, Mayor and Deputy Mayor, we have the CDBG Sidewalk Improvement Program. Are you seeking to have this be added as an item on the agenda? Yes. Okay. And the documents that you are circulating now, is that related to the discussion item? That's already on? Okay, thank you very much. Just want to confirm that. So what I would like to have is a motion to amend the agenda to remove the DPW resolution number two related to uh, the senior center improvements to add in its place the DPW resolution regarding community development block grant sidewalk improvement program and to add uh, these three discussion items Pontiac teenager Anthony Rodriguez reported missing, sickle cell blood drive signups low and community help needed, and the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan Pontiac Capacity Building grant opportunity. Those would follow the one discussion item uh, in that order, uh, which is the Youth Recreation Center that's already on the discussion. Is there such a motion? So move. So move. Support. It has been moved by Councilman Nicholson, seconded by Pro Tem Carrington, that we make uh, these in one fell swoop, amendments to the agenda. Is there any discussion on this? And after we vote on this, we can always make additional amendments as well. Hearing no further discussion on this particular amendment, it would remove the senior improvements uh, resolution, add the sidewalk improvements resolution, and add those three discussions. If we're all clear on what's before us, roll call on adoption of this amendment <coughs> to the agenda, Clerk Doyle. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Yes. And Goodman? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. Are there any other amendments, discussions, or clarification about the agenda before us as amended? Hearing no further discussion, we now vote on adoption of the agenda as amended. Roll call, Clerk Doyle. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. The agenda for this evening is adopted. We are now at approval of the consent agenda. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. It has been moved by Councilman Goodman, seconded by Pro Tem Carrington, that we approve this evening's consent agenda, which includes the meeting minutes from our most recent city council meeting. With that, roll call and adoption, Clerk Doyle. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. We are now at recognition of elected officials. Are there any elected officials in our community who would like to have the floor? All right, with that, we are now at agenda address. Pro Tem Carrington, you have the floor. Thank you, President McGinnis. First, uh, we have Mr. Quincy Stewart. Yes, I want to address the Lawn Chair Concert Series. Just wanted to say, first of all, uh, to everybody, Mike and everybody, thank you guys for coming out to my concert. It was really a really nice affair, and I appreciate the whole town. So many people came out, and... I don't know how many concerts I'll ever do in my life, but when I get to play in front of all of my home to pound town people, that's the best you could ever do, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, with regard to Gwen Fox, is going to be at Charlie Harrison Park on September 8th, 2022. If you don't know Gwen Fox, you should come out in here. She is a consummate performer, and she's our own homegrown. So on September the 8th at Charlie Harrison Park, on 537 University Drive, please come out and support our sister Gwen Fox and have a good time. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, at 6 o'clock. Thank, thank you. 
Dr. Deidre Waterman. Win Fox is great, uh, as I'm sure you were, uh, Quincy Stewart. I came to speak to the items on the agenda related to the uh, Sheriff's Department agenda items uh, and to remind people that the Sheriff's Department does work at the behest of the citizens of Pontiac. Uh, I heard the discussion last week about uh, several people who came and talked about the discussion prolonged about whether there had been excessive use of force in those two incidents. Uh, Mr. Charles Renfro from the Crestwood Asterwood District and I heard that there was going to be some investigation uh, of the, uh, by the SRT, uh, which is the Police Department, Sheriff Bouchard's Public Relations Unit. So they are appointed and picked by the Sheriff Bouchard. I heard you say, Pastor Parker, that can we do our own internal investigation? Yes, there is, and I came to give you that knowledge. Within the city charter, it does say, that the mayor has the responsibility and the uh, opportunity to appoint a police review board. And I always, as mayor, as two-term mayor, reserve the right to appoint that reserve board if there was something that I felt that we needed to convey in terms of how our, patient, how our citizens in Pontiac were treated. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention as well within the mayor's responsibility and, uh, and availability to do that. Uh, and uh, I never had to do that as mayor because I always had the understanding with Sheriff Bouchard that he would come and address any issues that I felt needed to be addressed. Uh, Pastor, I'm sorry, Captain Ewing and his other cohorts did a lovely job of presenting to the people what the investigation is being done. But he also said that he has no power to hire, fire, or uh, discipline officers. But, all right. So we just have to remember that. And the mayor has to be the one who represents the city and makes sure that the citizens are treated and that the sheriff department does act according to the tenants that the citizens of Pontiac do hold uh, them responsible for. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chuck Johnson, what item on the agenda? Well, just give me, just you can. Number one's all right. Thank you very much, Chuck Johnson here. You know, oftentimes, <clears throat> excuse me, we can come to this mic and we can make comment, say a lot of different things. And uh, these lips that we have can, can be a killer sometimes. And some of the things that come through them uh, is regretful at a lot of occasions. I'm kind of reminded of last week's uh, meeting here. I wasn't in the room at the time, but it's my understanding that there was some words being used and said that wasn't becoming to one of the citizens who came here and uh, made comment. And one of the council folk didn't uh, like the way it was said or how it was said. So then there was some discussion. So now I notice on the agenda that there is, there is some concerned about that and uh, you know uh, I, I've often noticed when a person says something and they want to put their foot on it and try to make it worse than what it really is it's, you know that's not good you can say things and let it be at that and then go along and I'm talking about this government because this government I admire very much I mean I like all of you up there I mean you you're dead on but this incident that happened, and, and we're talking about so happening to a responsible citizen, and whether you like what they say or what she said or not, you have no reason to call them or her or him or whoever out of their name, and that's what my understanding is. So I'm going to leave this matter up to the council, and hopefully you'll decide, based upon your rules and regulations, that you'll do something about this matter. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, sir. Ms. Regina Campbell. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, City Council. And so I'm here. I was going to speak on uh, Agenda 2, and you guys removed it. So what is the protocol? Can we still <laughs> make a comment, or I need to wait till you put it on back on the agenda? Since you're here this evening and you were anticipating it was published on the agenda, you can certainly feel free to speak to it. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to piggyback on the pastor who said that we, that we want to uh, work together with peace and harmony in our community. 
One of the things that I wanted to talk about today was the uh, number two, which was the Senior Citizen Building, looking for some transparency um, as it relates to the DPD, DPW department uh, when they get ready to uh, award the uh, project. Um, there was some things that uh, PDSI contractors sent over to Mr. Cooley to address as a relate, because they did not get a, I'm on behalf, speaking on behalf of PDSI contractors today. They didn't get a debriefing. And so um, there are some things that we wanted to have addressed or answered as it relates to the RFP. And so um, my comments was today was to look for more transparency as it relates to a debriefing, as it relates to there were some blinds that were removed off of the bid that uh, obviously they must have called the other contractor to let them know we're removing it. We didn't get a call. So that means that's open for negotiations. You're removing numbers off of a bid. So um, that's one of the things we were talking about. The other thing was that uh, the alternates that, that was came up. So if you look at, I don't know if the city council members have got the bottom line numbers, but in that bottom line number, you'll see the difference was very minimal. Um, there was not, as you look at the solicitation, it talks about MBE uh, participation. We don't know what the card, what the scoring mechanism is when they determined the contractor, the potential contractor award. So um, I see that it's been postponed, so we're, and I don't know why it's postponed. That does um, conclude your time. Thank you. Mr. Bill Maxey, what agenda item? Good afternoon. H. Bill Maxey, District 1, Citizen. The disapproval of the August the 23rd conduct by one of our council persons. I lived in District 1. I've been there 30 years. My comments are short. District 1 citizens support this resolution coming from the council, and we really appreciate it. Later on in my comments, I will make other remarks. As Mr. Johnson said, he left one thing out, senior citizen verbal abuse is as powerful as physical abuse. And that type of conversation or expressions will not be tolerated. District 1 fully support the disapproval of the comments made last Tuesday by our elected official. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Ms. Gloria Miller. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to go over uh, item number, I'm going to skip over, item number 18, the Open County uh, Prosecutor's Office Racial Justice Advisory Council Second Annual Justice Resource Fair, which is going to be held at, well, we call it the Mill Dam, but with that park. Uh, I brought that up because that's what we're going through right now is some racial justice in the city of Pontiac with this incident, two incidents in the city of Pontiac. It would be it would be advisable. Maybe the council could have someone to come down here and speak in regards to that, because as someone has spoke earlier, something needs to be done about this. This this shouldn't be pushed on the road, uh, because if you don't do anything, then it's going to get worse in the city. Uh, this, and then I want to go back to item number six, the HR department, uh, even though I don't work here, but I still have contact. So uh, maybe one of the council people addressed it last week, HR department. No one got paid last uh, Thursday, I was told. HR was down. And all the money that has been invested in HR, even when I was sitting up there, and now that's a travesty. People work for two weeks and can't get their check. I see that uh, I look like the mayor got it on agenda for new equipment. How much money are we going to spend on this city? We hired a new staff. We brought in new people. We contracted them out. And we still can't quite get it right. And people don't get paid. That's, that's not going to work. I'm not going to speak on the other items until I watch. I like to see what the council is going to do. I don't come here just to criticize. I come just to keep what uh, I'm trying to think his name on TV, 
I just like to keep you honest. I just want to see what you do. And then I follow for what you do. Your action contradicts what I do. Because I only work for the people. I come down here only because I work for the people. And uh, so we'll see from that. Those two items are the only things I wanted to discuss tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Larry Jasper. He's not present. That concludes our agenda address. All right. We are now at agenda items. Uh, City Council resolution. Is there a motion to approve the resolution stating disapproval of conduct at the August 23rd, 2022 City Council meeting? Support. It has been moved by Councilman Goodman, seconded by Councilman Parker. Uh, at the beginning of this council term and every January, we review our council rules and procedures. Uh, the rules and procedures state that no council members shall speak until recognized for that purpose by the presiding officer. And after such recognition, the council member shall confine discussion to the question at hand. Uh, council members should address their remarks to the presiding officer, maintain a courteous tone, and avoid interjecting a personal note into debate. And, uh, and further, it speaks to how citizen participation uh, will be that each individual shall address the city council in an orderly and dignified manner and shall not engage in conduct or language that disrupts, makes fun of, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of the council meeting, and that members of the audience shall not engage in disorderly or boisterous activity. And so that responsibility is to all of us as a city council, and then myself as the presiding officer, to implement, to enforce those rules and procedures for all seven of us, the mayor and deputy mayor, and all residents that are here as well. So that way, the meeting runs effectively for you, for us, and for our community, because we're dealing with very serious matters. So at last week's city council meeting, when there temporarily, temporarily was a breakdown in that order, we wanted to go on record as saying that we do not approve of that breakdown. Uh, our colleague has uh, already at that meeting uh, publicly apologized and uh, acknowledged that that disruptive conduct was uh, not acceptable, um, but we still want to make sure that we uh, are making it official uh, as this is an appropriate step in response to that violation of the rules and procedure and that further steps in the future, if needed, can be taken, but this is the appropriate step uh, at this juncture, uh, but that's up for debate now with the City Council. Since we essentially, on behalf of you, the people, we govern ourselves in terms of how we conduct and, and, and carry out the people's business at City Council meetings and execution of our duties. So with that, is there any discussion tonight? Councilman Nicholson, you have the floor. Uh, I think while we consider this resolution, um, I also look to um, our leadership on this dais to enforce the opposite as well. That night we saw council leadership take action during that outburst and uh, bringing the group back to order. Um, I know during those comments there were several um, things on the opposite side of this dais that were said that I feel were abusive language. Um, and. I think that I think we need to balance those rules and that enforcing when we have someone who's at the dais who uses uh, derogatory terms or um, abusive language or even sometimes racial remarks. I think we need to make sure that that's enforced as well. Others that wish to have the floor. Well, Councilwoman James. I just like to say though that as council people, we are in positions of authority and in positions where we can and do hold others accountable. And where we can and do hold others accountable, we are obligated to hold ourselves accountable. So even though that there are things, may have things get said on the other side, uh, our, you know, our focus has to be that we are are controlling ourselves and that we're holding ourselves as a body accountable for uh, not only the decisions that we make but our conduct so this is this is an appropriate resolution and uh, we're hopeful that you know that this will be all that we need to do uh, that you know going forward because we definitely as a, as a group want to be held accountable by the city of Pontiac at, you know, for the work that we do. And we want to be able to focus on the work that we do. So 
I, I support the resolution. I think it's, it's, it's very important and it just says what, what we need to do at, at this present time. Anyone else that wish to have the floor? Councilman Parker. Thank you, Brother President. I certainly don't want to belabor this issue because it's already been adjudicated in the, in the court of public opinion anyway. But I will say this. Uh, we are, should and should be held to a higher standard because we have submitted ourselves to a place where a higher standard is necessary. And yet we know that when people err, we, we certainly want to make sure that justice is tempered with mercy. We want to make sure that we recognize that had it not been for God on our side, we could have all been in that position. We also want to recognize that sometimes people come with the purpose of pushing buttons just to get a reaction. And so when you consider all those things being relevant to this issue, um, I support the, the resolution as it stands. And I, con and I just continue to believe that we will learn from this, this, this incident, because every incident should be a teaching opportunity that we should learn from, grow from, and learn how to do better. And I, in addition with the rest of this council, I apologize for our behavior last week because we are one body and we, what one does, we all get, get, get swept into. And so I apologize for what happened last week because it, we could conduct ourselves better and we need to conduct ourselves better. So let's move forward. Let's continue to remember that we represent not one individual person, but 61,000 people in the city of Pontiac, and they deserve better. Thank you. Any further discussion? I do want to share that um, we will continue to work hard to ensure orderly, efficient, and effective city council meetings for the benefit of this body. Um, but our entire city and you, the residents. And so that is a commitment that we will continue to work hard on and improve upon when we falter. With that, hearing no further discussion, roll call and adoption of the resolution stating the disapproval of conduct at the August 23rd, 2022 City Council meeting. Clerk Doyle. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. The motion carries. The resolution is adopted. Is there a motion to adopt the uh, resolution? Let me make sure I get to it correctly. It's an addition uh, to the agenda. Um, but it is um, a motion to adopt the resolution to author the mayor and DPW to enter into a contract with Great Lakes Contracting Solutions for the 2022 CDBG Sidewalk Improvement Program contract. Is there a motion? So moved. Support. It has been moved by Councilman Nicholson, seconded by Councilman Parker. That motion is now before us. Resolution uh, is first given to the administration for uh, information and presentation. Yeah, thank you, uh, President McGinnis, and I want to defer to Mr. Cooley to run through uh, the details here, but obviously we have a lot of sidewalks in the city that are in very serious need of repair, uh, and the previous uh, city council approved utilizing some CDBG dollars for the purpose of repairing sidewalks. Uh, so we went out to bid and received a couple of bids. Mr. Cooley will run through the details in that regard. The, the one thing that I uh, would ask, Mr. Cooley, is for you to explain uh, the division of uh, CDBG years here, because I know that the lowest bid was $1.1 million, roughly. Uh, but in terms of the immediate work that will be done, it'll be in the amount of about $624,000. So if you can explain why that amount of initial work doesn't match the $1.1 million and how the work will be divided between CDBG contract years uh, or otherwise supplemented by additional funds, uh, that would be great. Yeah, so um, as the mayor had said, uh, we, we were um, awarded dollar, CDBG dollars um, for the 2020 
CDBG year and a 2021 CDBG year. Uh, those amounts, those two years, amount to that $624,203.84. Um, there was another um, award from the previous council that is for the $2,022, but those dollars do not come into effect until after uh, December of 2022, so we can't include them within this contract. Um, Oakland County administers those dollars, and, and I've been working closely with them and, and talking with them on when we can administer those dollars and, and when they can't. Um, the previous, back a couple of previous city engineers, when John Ballant was here, he had set up a program uh, for doing sidewalk repairs. That, that program was based off of uh, customer complaints and uh, city council complaints, the complaints that city council had forwarded to us. Um, they designated a map and they mapped out them areas uh, to try to bring closer together the work that would be done by the contractor. Uh, the more we can keep the contractor in a close confined area, the more work will be done and the cheaper rate we get uh, per um, square foot of concrete. Um, so this map has been an ongoing map. Um, typically whenever we do this type of work, um, we, we try to go through an engineer's estimate of how far we can make it within these sections. Uh, the, the engineer will put together the estimate. Uh, that'll give us an idea of what sections we want to take care of that are coming up next within the program. Um, we put those out to bid, and then when the bids come back in, that makes the decision on how far we can make it with what dollars were awarded. Uh, so even though the bids come in at $1.1 uh, then were all the sections we had hoped to do. Um, we do have a, a starting point and a, and a progression point that we have labeled within the RFP. Um, the contractor will start where we had asked him to start. He'll move through the, the sections we have labeled. When we run out of dollars, the contract will stop. We will keep record of where that, that work stopped. And then when we do those next group of dollars next year, we'll rebid this again and we'll pick back up in that same section and start moving through. Um, excuse me, I was just getting a little bit dry there from talking so much. Um, what we plan to do moving forward is uh, with all the, the new positions that we've been awarded, what the plan for the engineering department was is to bring in um, some engineering staff so that we could go out. Thank you very much. Uh, we could go out and uh, I'm going to take a quick drink, if you don't mind. With the, um, with the new staffing, we would be able to send them out, have them evaluate all the sidewalk within the city on a rating system that would fall within our asset management program, which would really detail out the hot spots throughout the city uh, so that we would have more of a dedicated spot to start at versus just basing it off of customer complaints the way we're doing it currently. Um, while we feel that that's the best program to move forward on, we just don't have the ability to wait for that program to get started to actually get this work done. Uh, so the, the best case scenario is to continue on what the previous engineers had um, allocated for the work through a uh, complaint basis. And then once we start the new pro program, we can start over with a mapping. With that, the speakers list, Councilman Nicholson, followed by Councilman Parker and Pro Tem Carrington. Councilman Nicholson, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, for the residents of District 2, uh, the um, Zone 5 um, uh, looks like that's where the work will resume most most soon is Zone 5. Yeah, there's, there's um, one little section uh, off of Chamberlain that was left over from the previous contract that will be picked up that's a small little section will not take that long, and then the the contract starts in uh, section five, which would be Pioneer Highlands. Great, yeah. Um, it, we we have a lot of mature trees in that neighborhood that we know have caused the the majority of the upheaval of those sections. Is there root remediation that happens as part of this replacement? Yeah. So um, as long as the contractor can remove the roots without killing the tree, the roots will be cut down, and then the slabs will be put back into place. Um, if they feel that it's going to kill the tree by cutting as, as many roots as they have to, the tree will come down. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Parker, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Cooley, for this information. I certainly want to uh, view it very carefully. 
for those who are in the exit in the portion of it exhibit six is what I believe encompasses district five and I just want to thank you for this information but I'm certain if the if you recall when you came to our CDC meeting you gave us a map and we're still digesting that map and we will probably be having some additional conversations regarding the sidewalks in district five okay I look forward to that thank you president pro tem Carrington you have the floor uh, thank you president McGinnis um, just got a, a few questions we just was given it so please forgive me if you you already answered this because I was trying to read it real quickly at the same time pay attention to you I understand um, you stated concerning um, the bids uh, is it any reason why you didn't take the lowest bid for this particular contract we are taking the lowest bid there was only two bids uh, one bid was at a, a million one and the second bid was over two million dollars well, uh, I'm looking for your bid sheet. Did uh, Newark and Franz Eng Engineers also bid? Th they are an engineer firm. That's an engineer's estimate. That doesn't okay. go out until that's just what we based our work off of. So um, that's the engineer's estimate of what we thought the work would cost. All right. And my follow-up question is concerning um, your plan of work. Uh, you, you say you're starting on Chamberlain Street, and then you go into the back of the pamphlet to Exhibit 6 and work your way back? <laughs> so uh so currently the way the, the, you won't get any action this 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 year so i'm just want to make sure yeah that so my residents understand yeah so the um it, it is listed within the rfp of where the sections are we are going to do chamberlain street then we'll we go to section five uh what's listed in the mapping is is called out as number five from there it goes to number three then to number 10 and then to 15 which would be uh district six so district six was at the end of this one um but it will be at the beginning of the the next group of dollars and we were awarded uh eight hundred and ten thousand for the 22 uh dollars so there is more work going to be done in 22 than this year so I, I guess my concern is that you guys haven't done a community assessment assessment of these sidewalks to determine which areas should be be undertaken first so uh, I'm hoping in the future that you will have a process to do an assessment before you start deciding what areas to repair in the city I just so, want to make sure this process is equal and fair uh, process it, and I agree and that that's what our hope is to move forward with with the new staffing um, just something I guess a, a little piece of it that I left out that you know the map was built off of complaints but then we did, Noah Confrost is the engineers that put this group together for us. They did go out and do some preliminary looks to make sure that the areas that we received complaints in did, you know, honestly were in need of quite a bit of repair. So there was some, some quick looks, but we haven't been able to do a full evaluation of the entire city. And that's, that's the program we want to get started is so that we have the entire city evaluated and we can base it off of ratings that way. All right. Thank you. No further questions, though. President McGinnis. Thank you, Councilwoman James, and then Mayor Grimal. Yeah, my my concern with this uh, process is that it really doesn't allow us to tell uh, our constituents anything because it's just not specific enough that we can go to someone who lives on a particular street and say, okay, you know, in September the city will be working on the sidewalks on your street. Uh, all we can do is say that sidewalk work is being done but because it's, it's very unclear where these, this company is going to be operating, what street they're going to be operating on, and then the whole idea that as soon as the money is over, is spent, they stop and, you know, so you don't want to give people the expectation that they're going to have something repaired and then it doesn't get repaired so it this 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 process leaves a lot to be desired that's all i can say it it leaves a lot to be desired it's not an ideal process so if we have something better that we can go to ideally i would like something where I know what streets are being worked on. You, you're, you're, you, you've got sections set out, but we really need to be able to know what streets are going to be worked on within a certain time frame so that we can communicate to those people who live on those streets about that. Or if we have a call from somebody on that street, we can talk to them about that. With this plan, we can't do that. 
So within this plan, we do know what the schedule is going to be. We do know once the contract's awarded, the contractor will start, like I said, on Chamberlain Street, and then they will move into that Section 5. All the streets within those sections that are outlined in those separate maps that were included here are what the streets they'll be working on. Um, of course, not knowing how long it's going to take them to get through that section, it's very hard to lay out a timeline that states they're going to be at this street at this time. What will happen is our... our uh, engineering partners that are out there doing the inspection of this work they will be notifying the residents ahead of time we usually give a couple of weeks notice that hey we're going to be within your area and making repairs to the sidewalks yeah. so the residents will be notified that the contractors coming it's just it won't be a long-term couple of month notification it'll be as we get there um, and then there's really no way of knowing if the the contractor is going to be working on a specific uh, sidewalk uh, uh, parcel that a a constituent has called in about and yeah, I had a picture of one that was just way way off so I could say to the person that yes the sidewalk contractor is working in your area but there I don't know whether they are actually going to make a repair where they want that repair you see what I'm saying so there is a criteria spelled out within the RFP. So if there is a sidewalk that's lifted that high and we make it to that area, it will be repaired. But, but we're only allocated so many dollars to do so much work. So I, I can't guarantee that we're going to make all these sections based off the dollars that we have. Um, it's not a foolproof system, I agree with you. And we want to we want to make the system better and we want to make improvements to it. But we don't want to not do any work currently right now where we're just going to continue to get farther behind. There was mm -hmm. no work done for so long a time within the city that we were way behind the eight ball on all these repairs that are being made. Um, I did send out a, a memo uh, late this afternoon that kind of explained um, just a little bit about how much sidewalk there is within the city and the local streets um, and how much it would cost to repair all the sidewalk within the city. And... Um, you know, the, the way the ordinance is, is written, the ordinance is written is that it's actually the homeowner's responsibility to repair the sidewalks. Um, it's it's because of the council and because of the administration of why we're using these CBD gel, CDBG dollars to make the repairs ourselves. Are you able to, Mayor Grimel's next on the speaker's list, but since you invoked that, do you have the approximate figure of what it would take to comprehensively repair the sidewalks throughout the entirety of the city of Pontiac? Um, just on local streets, I believe that was in the $83 million range. Yeah. And that's based off of currently we're paying um, for a basic flag of sidewalk, say, in the middle of your yard where there's not a lot of obstructions, a lot of roots, a lot of issues. It's about $250 for each 5x5x4 five by five by inch thick slab. Um, they call them a flag of a sidewalk. Um, when you move into the driveway, the driveway area, that becomes a 6-inch uh, flag so it, the costs increase uh, so it could go anywhere from 250 to as much as uh, $500 or higher depending on if the tree needs to be cut down if there's a breaker wall against it uh, depending on what work needs to be done to satisfy that sidewalk work so just taking uh, the miles of um, we have 158 miles of local roads so you'd have to double that number put you about 316 miles of sidewalk within just our local roads uh, to replace all of that sidewalk would be in that $83 million range. Thank you for the information. Mayor Grimel, you have the floor. Well, but I, I do just want to temper that a little bit. I, that's based on the idea of replacing all of the sidewalk. Yeah, that, right? that was just a, that's just a number that if we had to go in and replace all the sidewalk. Yeah, now, we're not course, replacing all, all the sidewalk. All of our sidewalks are not in bad shape. Only portions of a sidewalk Correct. are in bad shape. So I do just want to caution that that figure is premised on replacing all of the sidewalks when we know that not every foot of sidewalk in the city needs to be replaced. Yes. Up the floor. Was that the point you wanted to make? No, I, that was just in response to what Mr. Cooley immediately said. The, the point I wanted to make is we, we agree with the point made by President Pro Tem Carrington that uh, we really need to do a systematic review of sidewalks and their condition in the community and prioritize uh, the streets and sections of the city that need to be done first. Um, you know, obviously, as a practical matter, it's not 
practical to prioritize each individual slab in the order that each individual slab in the city as a whole needs to be done because there's uh, work and, and labor mobilization uh, costs. So once workers are mobilized in an area, they should do all of the slabs that need to be done in that area before moving on to the next neighborhood. But we should get a comprehensive sense of what uh, the condition of sidewalks is by neighborhood so that we can prioritize by neighborhood which neighborhoods have the most need for repair and uh, move accordingly. We're uh, hopeful that we'll have that opportunity because the Pontiac Collective Impact Partnership in collaboration with Oakland University is doing that work to get a comprehensive sense of the condition of sidewalks throughout the community. Now exactly how much of that work they'll do and how comprehensive their study is has yet to be seen. But by working with them and utilizing some of the data that they're going to be putting together, we're hopeful that that will help guide our future decision making in terms of the order of priority of what neighborhoods need to be done first uh, when it comes to sidewalk repair work. Thank you. Uh, my largest question, what most glaring question was, what gives with Chamberlain? So you've already answered that. Uh, thank you for that intel. Uh, I think that the City Council has expressed that we want it to be done in the most effective way, but also where the greatest problems are, are handled first. And so going forward, I think there's great value for us as city decision makers to have that sidewalk assessment. The mayor has invoked that there's some, you know, philanthropic and, and uh, educational institutions that are interested in partnering on that. My understanding is that the funding, at least at this stage, did not materialize. So that's something that we'll need to keep pursuing um, because there is a cost involved. Um, mm -hmm. I think I had heard the figure of seventy-five thousand um, dollars, but you know, if it requires a match from us to get part of the way there, to then meet where a, a granting partner or an educational institution is up for doing that, it can make our long-term decisions a lot stronger. Uh, and uh, with my yes vote tonight, um, I hope my colleagues acknowledge that when the next cycle comes and it's a lot more heavy in some of the other council districts, we understand that there is that balancing act um, because with the limited resources, we aren't able to get to everywhere. I do support the contractor, your, your contracted services being as effective as possible. So doing one slab here and then going three miles over here to do one slab here and one slab there, that's not sustainable and it's not going to get us the, the most sidewalk for these dollars. Uh, so acknowledging that this is one of many waves uh, that can come, but also there's other sources of sidewalk replacement or repair that can happen. Uh, for example, on my street last year, Consumers Energy, when they were going under the sidewalk, did a whole bunch of work in our neck of the woods and replaced it with new sidewalk. Uh, Councilman Nicholson, I just drove Elizabeth Lake Road today, looked like a lot of sidewalk action was happening with Liberty and Mark and, and Thorpe and those. With the WRC pro project, right. so yeah. The Water Resources Commission, when they're doing the work, the sidewalk inevitably has to be replaced. Um, and, and there may be other opportunities where we can leverage other funding sources so we can maximize the improvements to be done that don't have to be shouldered directly by the property owner, but can you offer for residents tonight, if they have a, a slab in front of their house and they want to take responsibility and, and, and foot the bill to get that improved or replaced, is there a process in place and what should a resident do? They, I anticipate they coordinate with the city of Pontiac on that front, correct? Yeah, uh, any, any resident that wanted to t undertake that on their own uh, would come into the DPW office and speak with the engineering team, with the right-of-way inspector, with with our engineering supervisor Jack Cady, uh, and they would they would pull the proper permits to do that work, and then they would give them what the specs are. They would lay out all the specs of what our sidewalks are and what how they need to be replaced, and you know what condition and type. Other discussion on the motion before us. Yeah, I, I just have one question, Councilman Parker. You have one the floor. more question. If when you get to my neighborhood and you're working on my sidewalk and you're already there and I want my driveway done. Is there a process by which you could help do that? If I paid for it? No, if I paid for it. If I agree, you said I could pay for a block of sidewalk. Can I pay to get the driveway? 
right so so um we we don't currently have that built into this rfp but it is something that the administration and we have talked about to, to bring the contractor on board with that exact thing that if the contractor is in the neighborhood order in the chambers a, when you a resident the, hear the presenter director cooley has the floor and a resident would like to pay to have some extra work done that the contractor could do that and a resident could pay that contractor directly that is something that we want to build into future contracts okay thank you councilwoman james yeah i would just like to i i uh support the um uh the request but i'm just going forward as we work on better ways of doing this i would like to go back to a, pro a process of getting the homeowners involved because you know it's homeowners, it's their home. Uh, they're concerned about sidewalk safety. In many cases, you're, you're, you've got seniors uh, who are in with walkers, and they've got these nightmare sidewalks. So I, I, I favor a process that gets the homeowners involved. You know, even if we go back to where the homeowner is responsible, and we find a way to, because I've talked to some order of the, in the chambers. I've Councilman to James some of the has homeowners the floor and. Uh, the comment that that I heard was if they could if the city could space those payments out rather than have it all come on one tax bill whether the city could space those out over a number of tax bills but I, I really would like to see the individual homeowners have more input in this whole sidewalk um, program so Councilman Nicholson and Councilman Rutherford. Yeah, I, I concur. Um, I, I, my question also could be, um, I guess this would be more for my colleagues to potentially talk about when we're, we're talking about um, something that would add value not just to the property owner but to the surrounding community that we may look to waive those residential permitting fees for somebody replacing the sidewalk in front of their house. Um, just to make that more affordable. And uh, if they're enhancing the right of way, the public right of way, I think that that seems very um, thoughtful. Um, I, I too like that uh, concept of having that be an opportunity in the future because many, much of my district does not qualify for these dollars. Um, and that's in those historic homes with the larger trees that have historically pulled up those those slabs. Um, I do have an email in that I'm looking for just for some idea about there is... Um, there was a previous map that talked about funding from years ago, years forward, um, and, and it had some highlighted areas. Um, I have a resident who has a lot of concerns in front of their house on Cherokee, um, and they, the map falls maybe just four addresses short of theirs. Where it does pick up, those slabs seem all to be in perfect condition, but above that and the four, they were, they're really, I mean, they're, they're TP'd. Um, so, I, um, I just look forward to uh, some, some consideration. I don't know if really four addresses to another address could mean the difference between eligible and not eligible. I'm just try trying to figure out what, how to move forward with that resident and let them know whether or not this is something we could potentially look at moving that area if we see that, no, actually all the slabs in that highlighted zone are in decent shape and we could potentially adjust that one way or the other. Okay, and so within that section of Cherokee, are they in the... Uh, non-eligible area that's what I'm not I'm not sure of I mean okay. it, one block to the next block I mean, there it's it's seemingly all we, this we can we can take a look at the homes at the map and and, okay. and do a, a deeper dive into what right. it is thank you councilman Rutherford I just want us to be conscious and careful about telling people what they can and cannot afford not every homeowner can afford to get the sidewalks fit what somebody can afford in district seven they can't afford in district one or in district five so we have to be conscious of when we make these statements how does it apply to each individual household because each individual household knows how much they can and cannot afford and some of the elderly can't afford to get their uh, block fit so Montana on Montana, Nevada, stuff like that, Harrison. So we have to be conscious when we say put it back on the homeowner. Some of them are living pillar to post, paycheck to paycheck. So please be conscious of that. That's it. Councilman Goodman. And to quickly add to that, also let us do recognize that the city of Pontiac is a heavy renter city. And that we're, so we're talking about homeowners. We do recognize that we're also including uh, landlords in this and while maybe homeowners will absolutely take the initiative to invest in our community and in their home we also have to be aware that in doing some of this we're, we're kind of putting the ball in their court to do nothing in some cases and that's why we have to be aware of that as we're having this discussion 
A uh, follow-up question. Councilman Nicholson invoked the permit for sidewalk repair. What is the current cost if a, a resident was seeking to initiate? Is there a permit cost? Uh, typically, it's it's uh, fifty dollars to pull a right-of-way permit, um, and then there's associated fees with inspection, and, and uh, they're based off of the cost of the job. Okay, thank you for that information. That's helpful as we uh, investigate and research that in the future about opportunities. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on the motion before us? It is a resolution uh, to authorize the mayor and the Department of Public Works to enter into a contract with Great Lakes Contracting Solutions for the 2022 CDBG Sidewalk Improvement Program contract. Any further discussion? Speakers list having been exhausted, Roll call and adoption of the resolution, Clerk Doyle. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? No. Carrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Six J's, one nay. That motion Thank carries. You. The resolution is adopted. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to approve a budget amendment for fiscal year 2022-23 to transfer $5,870 from the general fund balance GL account 101-000-390-000 to the general fund GL account 101-690-702.000 salaries and wages, redevelopment and housing? So moved. Support. It has been moved by Councilman Goodman, seconded by Councilwoman Rutherford. This item is now before us. For those in the audience, the text of that is, in addition on your printed agendas, is, is on the uh, technological display, if you will. Uh, this is a follow-up to a motion we approved a few weeks ago that um, authorized the posting of this budget amendment. It was properly posted. Time was given to allow the public to know what was coming. And it was also tied into uh, the recent approval and hiring by the mayor and the approval of that uh, action by this city council for the new community development director uh, that will oversee the planning, economic development, and building departments. Uh, that's what's before us. And so it just makes a, a budgetary tweak of a very small uh, sum. Is there any discussion? So again, it's a continuation of a conversation we had two weeks ago at City Council. Hearing no uh, speakers list requests, speakers list is exhausted. Roll call and adoption of the resolution. Clerk Doyle. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to approve the agreement for local fiscal recovery fund distribution between Oakland County and the City of Pontiac for the Pontiac Storm and Sanitary Sewer Inflow and Infiltration Removal and Sewer Rehabilitation Project in the amount of $500,000? I'll move. Support. It has been moved by Councilman Rutherford, seconded by Councilman Goodman. That motion is now before us. Mayor Grimal, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, President McGinnis. Uh, I'd like to ask Ms. Borengester to come to the podium to, to talk about this. Uh, I think Council uh, is a little bit familiar with this being in the works and in the pipeline, uh, but Ms. Borengester, why don't you get into the details of this grant? Sure. Thank you so much. The City of Pontiac was recently awarded $500,000 from Oakland County from its Local Government Critical Infrastructure Planning Grant Program. Um, this will support the city's storm and sewer, sanitary sewer inflow and infiltration removal and sewer rehab project. Um, it will include preparation of a clean water state revolving fund project plan in order to apply um, to have WRC apply for a low interest loan and potential um, disadvantaged principal forgiveness for a project to remove inflow and infiltration from the sanitary sewer system as required um, by EGLE. The project also includes planning efforts to evaluate on the city's side of things um, and identify storm and sanitary sewer pipes that require rehab rehabilitation to determine the most cost effective intervention and prepare a five year capital improvement plan that coordinates the construction with other infrastructure improvements throughout the city. So a portion of these resources will be applied to the storm sewer side of the water system, which is um, the city owned and operated, and the other half will go to, um, will be regranted or subgranted to WRC, the Water Resources Commission, um, to focus on the sanitary side. Um, before we get into the specifics, I would also like to note um, that we did 
receive word this week from the WRC that um, some of this work had already begun um, on their side of things, and they did actually receive principal forgiveness for um, the project. Um, the Pontiac project was um, part of the 2023 project priority list that was posted for the Clean Water State Revolving Fund. Pontiac's project was ranked number one in priority and received 100% principal forgiveness and a total of $12.75 million. So that's $12.75 million that will be, in practical terms, how will that manifest for Pontiac residents? Um, so the, the details of that actual project are in the hands of the engineers, which I am not, and uh, don't play one on TV. But um, the WRC will manage that portion of the project, and it will be to um, uh, mitigate um, the inflow and infiltration removal of the sanitary sewer system um, in the hands of WRC. And that, that, that will all happen in the city of Pontiac. Thank you very much for the information. Uh, speakers list uh, from council members. Councilwoman Rutherford, you have the floor. So the storming system that's in Washington Park that's always affected um, when it rains, how would that money infiltrate out of the 500000 into that? So the actual um, portions of the... Uh the sewer system that are mapped out to be addressed. Um, I, I'm not the decider of, of those types of things. I believe that it's in the hands of the DPW and the engineering contractor. So is that a question for the executive side? Um, it would be a question for the Department of Public, Work, Public Works or the engineering department. I don't believe that's been determined. Uh, so I guess my the follow-up question is when would that be decided and who's making the decision on which area because you do know if you're aware that when it rains in Washington Park the streets flood it causes a lot of drainage and so I just want to know if the money's gonna go to Washington Park yeah Mayor Grimley you have the floor so I, I don't have the complete answer and I don't see mr. Cooley still uh, here but we certainly will be prioritizing things in part based on the sources of problems that we are aware of and we're very much aware of some of the ongoing challenges in Washington Park. So as we allocate our $250,000 portion of this towards stormwater sewer uh, problems and scoping of the, of the drains, we will be looking at what areas have documented problems and prioritizing those first. Thank you. Other discussion? Um, this is tangentially, President. oh, I'm sorry, you have a Yep. Councilman Good uh, Nicholson, you have the floor. I'm, I'm wondering if um, administration's aware. I've seen some pipe tech uh, trucks out with um, vacuum, the, the large vac trucks that have been out pretty visually. I'm wondering if, if they're already starting work on some of the stormwater sewer remediation. It seems like they've been out and around and in areas where WRC is not active. Deputy Mayor Stevens? Um, I will have to look into that specifically. I did... Um, understand that some work has been started, but if you're saying that that's not WRC, correct? I will have to find out exactly who that is, like who's been paying that company to. And then for uh, Ms. Borncaster, the work that's already been started, are you aware of if that is the uh, the Lincoln Mark Thorpe uh, Liberty Street corridor? I'm not certain, but I can follow up with the WRC a and, and see. Massive project that has, so I assume, you know, $12.7 million, as we all know, gets eaten up really quickly. Um, and that project is, you know, probably about 10 blocks worth of, water, you know, fresh water lines that are being um, replaced. So I wonder if that's already sort of fully spoken for or not. Um, I'm not certain, but I can certainly find the answer and, and follow up with you. Thank you. This and uh, prior items really emphasizes to me the value in citizens sharing what they're observing on their street, in their neighborhood, with their drains, with their potholes, with uh, what we were just previously talking about, the sidewalk deterioration. Um, how has the administration's progress been made about bringing online a new system or a streamlined process that is effective and to your satisfa satisfaction where residents can submit and track their request for action or just flagging for us because really the most valuable asset we have in improving our neighborhoods are the people that live in the neighbor in the neighborhood our neighbors they're they're on the ground and, and they get to see it day in and day out so just want to take an opportunity if we have an update at that point yeah the the key position in that regard is the community concern specialist position and that has been posted. We have received a number of applicants. We have not yet hired a person for that position. Uh, as you know, we're, we've got 
about 30 uh, positions that we're uh, trying to prioritize in terms of interviews and hiring decisions, so we're working through that process. But the community concern specialist uh, will be the person who's responsible for really standing up a comprehensive intake system for residents to provide their input, their questions, their concerns, their comments in a systematic and efficient way. Thank you. Others that wish to have the floor? Hearing no further discussion, this would be the resolution to approve the agreement for local fiscal recovery front fund distribution between Oakland County and the City of Pontiac for the Pontiac Storm and Sanitary Sewer Inflow and Infiltration Removal and Sewer Rehabilitation Project in the amount of $500,000, for which we are uh, quite grateful and enthused that it's coming our way, um, contingent on this vote right here. Hearing no further uh, speakers list, speakers list exhausted, roll call and adoption of this resolution, Clerk Doyle. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. The agreement is now approved, and hopefully the dollars, just like our storm and sanitary sewer lines, will flow smoothly. Uh, and now our next item is related to that. We made that approval, so now we need to account for it in the annual budget. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to authorize the city clerk to publish the notice of a proposed budget amendment for the fiscal year 2022-23 to increase budget revenues in the amount of $500,000 to the general fund in account 101-000-513.000 and appropriate an appropriation in the amount of $250,000 to account 101-699-818.000 other professional services and $250,000 to account 101-699 959.001 contribution to WRC. Is there such a motion? Man, support. It has been moved by Councilman Goodman, seconded by Councilwoman Rutherford. This item is before us. Again, this is just a procedural step. We're saying, hey, City Clerk, um, this is our intention. He'll post it, publish it in a newspaper of record, give time for the public to know about the, the movement of the money to come, and it'll be before us in this public body in two weeks. Is there any discussion on the motion before us? Hearing no dis further discussion, roll call on the adoption of the resolution. Clerk Doyle. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. The resolution is adopted. Clerk's office, please proceed accordingly. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to approve the mayor to sign and enter into a contract with ADP to replace the city's HR and payroll software system? So moved. It has been moved by Councilwoman Rutherford, seconded by Councilman Nicholson. Uh, that motion is now before us. We give the floor to the mayor and deputy mayor to give us information on what's before us. Yeah, thank you, President McGinnis. So the, the city had long used another a uh, software program to administer the city's payroll. We had already uh, developed concerns about that uh, payroll system and we're moving forward with an RFP to seek potential replacements of that. Uh, when our concerns were uh, verified in a stark and alarming manner, when the company that we had been using uh, for reasons entirely due to that company's error uh, botched uh, the city employee payroll uh, disbursements uh, last week. Uh, thanks to the quick action of a number of staff people, including and especially Deputy Mayor Stevens, uh, employees did receive their payment uh, within approximately 24 hours of that problem uh, being brought to our attention, uh, but it should have never happened in the first place, and it simply verifies and confirms uh, what we already believed, which is that the company we had been using uh, is not the right company to be using for our payroll, uh, which is why we had already started the process of going out with an RFP for a new company. 
Uh, and uh, we believe that ADP, which has a lot of experience in the world of payroll processing, is the right company to utilize. And uh, without further ado, I'd like Deputy Mayor Stevens to talk a little bit more uh, about the details here uh, and why we're proposing to move forward with ADP. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'll start by just giving a little bit more background about the current company that we're using. So we've been using that company for over two years now. And, by, and obviously we, all of us here, have not been with the city for two years. But by all accounts from employees, since the beginning of our time using that system, there have been processing errors. Uh, the, the most consistent processing error has been with the recording of time off. The system is, does not properly account for individuals' time off. And so over the course of the time that we have been in office, we have been manually adjusting time off figures because the system that we are currently using, no matter how many times we change the algorithm, it just won't stick and continues to have problems. So that was what originally prompted us to say, we need to look for another system. As the mayor said, unfortunately, the, the worst happened before we were able to go through the city's regular process of procurement to get another system. And we did contact our current um, vendor. And I, I will say that it took a while to get through to the right person. But once we did get through to the right person, that vendor did take full responsibility for, for the event. And we were able to get individuals paid um, within, you know, within a, a certain time frame, individuals who did not get paid on that same day, we did contact them to let them know the approximate time that we thought that they would get paid. And we have made um, arrangements to make sure that no city employee has a negative effect um, financially um, because of this particular event. Now, um, going forward, so after that happened, the administration immediately contacted council to ask for permission to bring this item to you before we had gone through the entirety of our regular um, procurement process to make sure that we do not run into this event again. Why am, why am I saying to make sure that we do not run into this event again? Because you would think that it would not happen again. But again, going by the company that we currently use by their own admission, this never should have happened. The, the specific item that they flagged they they cannot even explain why their system flagged it and caused us not to run payroll. So we cannot, because they cannot explain it, we cannot guarantee that it will not happen again. So we would like to move away from that um, system as quickly as possible. ADP is the only company out of the companies that we did reach out to that has um, responded with, um, that, that has responded. We also reached out to Paycor, Paychecks and Trinet. Um, ad additional to that, it will take ADP approximately 60 days to migrate all of our data and run all of the proper tests to make sure that everything is set up properly. So we would not like to wait any, any longer than absolutely necessary to be able to start this process. Um, are there any additional questions that the council may have for us? We had Councilman Nicholson, followed by Councilwoman James. Um, in, in my uh, line of work uh, in HR, processing payroll, payroll sometimes three times a week for different groups, um, uh, I was very upfront throughout the entire process in working with uh, the former HR contractor that Paylocity was not um, a great resource um, and that they are rife with these sorts of issues, especially having the majority of their support system um, be outsourced through multiple. Basically, they use um, a multi-source call center for support, um, so they use guidebooks. Um, so when you call, that same person may get a call for Paylocity, and then they may get a call for AAA. Um, so they're not 
their staff. Um, ADP actually makes an effort, having used ADP for a very long time, makes an effort that when you call ADP support, it's actually the local call center. So you're almost guaranteed to speak with somebody in Southfield. Um, so that's the best news. They'll be familiar with who Pontiac is and what that means when we call, which is very nice. Um, I know, uh, having worked um, as the chair of the Personnel and Finance Committee, um, that uh, Ms. Benitez, who will be the primary uh, user of this um, system, has used ADP her entire career, very comfortable uh, and confident in using that. Um, ADP is, you know, it's the gold standard. Um, they have all the bells and whistles, but they also have these fail-safes, especially with the majority of the staff being in a salaried position, um, where we, if all else fails, there is a uh, standard amount uh, that somebody makes, whether they're a full-time employee, 40 hour a week, this is their hourly or this is their salary, um, that even if the provider f fails to process the payroll, that um, they will be paid their standard pay. Um, so there is, you know, both fail safes on both sides. Um, so I think ADP is a very strong um, uh, option. And I think the only thing that you'll get from other providers, uh, one thing I do want to point out too for the public's benefit, um, and, and when we um, heard earlier about the amount of money that's been invested in HR in the past, it is now all in-house. Uh, but then also the implementation fee with ADP, because all of these are now cloud-based systems, we're not purchasing software. It's only it's it's a five hundred dollar expense, and that is mitigated through promotional pricing. In the in the, and you'll see in the contract it does state in the seventh and ninth month, um, those dollars are more than recovered um, to a actual cost savings. Um, and so I I think this is a, um, a, a the best most uh, prudent and and thoughtful manner to move forward in. Councilwoman James and then Mayor Grimal. Yes, I'd like to ask about the uh, uh, the contract. How long uh, are we, is this contract with ADP is going to be for us? It's a 12 month, two year. So that, that's a great question. What you have in front of you are pricing terms for uh, a one year. Once we approve these pricing terms, we will actually get a finalized contract and we can do that for one year, two years, whatever whatever length of time you would actually like us to do, but this represents the annualized cost for 12 months. Okay. One other. Please, on follow-up, Councilman well, James. One other question. Um, what What's the process in terms of being able to discontinue with the current provider and starting with them? You, you mentioned they have a 60 days. It's going to take about 60 days for them to get all of our information in that system. Does that mean that as early as 60 days or no earlier than 60 days, would we be able to transfer services? I will go with the as early, I will go no longer than 60 days. No so it may, it, it may happen faster, mm -hmm. but I would not hang my hat on that because we have to transfer all the data and then we have to run tests to make sure that it, the data is in there properly and that everyone is accounted for and that when they run their um, their test check runs that everything runs properly. So we would still be using Pelocity for the next 60 days until we got to that. Okay. Correct. Councilman Parker. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor Grimal was next, followed by Councilman Parker. Well, I, I just wanted to reflect on Councilman Nicholson's uh, comments. We certainly think this is the right decision as well, or we wouldn't be recommending it. Uh, and But I, I do just want to be transparent that the projected annual cost is more than what we've been paying Paylocity in this regard. Uh, the cost last fiscal year for Paylocity was uh, a little less than $17,000. Now, we believe the additional cost to uh, replace them with ADP is well warranted to ensure that our city government's most valuable resource, which is its employees, get paid on time as they obviously deserve to be. Councilman Parker, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. I just have a real question. Uh, certainly, there's a need to change out the systems, but is there a possibility that you can get both systems that as we are hiring on new employees, they don't get in the old system and have to be transferred over or start in the new system. I, c I can look into that. Um, I think the complexity of that would actually 
increase the risk that someone falls through the cracks of running two systems simultaneously. But I will definitely look into that for you. It just makes sense to me to put the new people in the new system as opposed to the old system and transfer. But have it in. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing no further discussion, speakers list exhausted. Uh, we now move to consider the adoption of the resolution to approve the mayor to sign and enter into a contract with ADP to replace the city's HR and payroll software system. Roll call and adoption of that resolution. Clerk Doyle. James. Yes. Guinness. Yes. Nicholson. Yes. Parker. Yes. Rutherford. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Goodman. Yes. Seven. Yes, no nay. That motion carries. The resolution is adopted. Uh, is there a motion to adopt a resolution to receive Oakland County uh, appropriation of American Rescue Plan Act local fiscal recovery funds to address safety concerns in the school district of the city of Pontiac? Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? A second. All right, it's been moved by Councilman Goodman. It is seconded by Councilwoman James. We actually don't have a resolution before us, so I'm going to write it in my mind right now and go very slowly with it. Um, I want to note that this funding for the Police School Liaison Officer uh, Program Agreement, um, the county has already funded this. So what we'd be doing is saying, yes, we will receive this, and then with the next action is what we would take action with. So this resolution would say, whereas the Oakland County Board of Commissioners on August 4th, 4th 2022 authorized a one-time appropriation not to exceed $200,000 in American Rescue Plan Act local fiscal recovery funds to the Oakland County Sheriff's Office budget to address safety concerns by creating one deputy two position to be assigned to the school district of the city of Pontiac. Therefore, be it resolved, the Pontiac City Council hereby approves the agreement for local fiscal recovery fund distribution between Oakland County and the city of Pontiac for appropriating American Rescue Plan Act local fiscal recovery funds to address safety concerns in the school district of the city of Pontiac, funding source for police school liaison officer program agreement. And I'll be able to provide that in writing to the clerk's office. So that's the resolution. Essentially, it says the county created this money. We're willing to accept this one-time money of $200,000 from the county. And then we're going to give the administration an opportunity to give us the backstory information. I just had to do the housekeeping part of giving us a resolution to consider. So that's the whereas and the resolved. And now, administration, you have the floor to give us the scoop. And then speaker's list is Councilman Rutherford and Councilman Goodman first. Thank you, uh, President McGinnis. Uh, for a number of years, I believe since the time that the Sheriff's Department uh, first began assuming policing responsibilities in the city of Pontiac. Uh, the school district has utilized sheriff's deputies uh, to uh, police the schools. However, the school district has not done so by contracting directly with the sheriff's department, but has instead contracted with the city. In other words, the city, as everyone knows, has a contract uh, with the Sheriff's Department and the school district has been a subcontractor with the city to receive deputy services. Why it has been done that way in the past is, is not clear to me. I only learned of that uh, in the past couple of months. Uh, it's my view that it would make much more sense to eliminate the middleman, uh, which is the city, and to have the school district contract directly with the sheriff's department. Uh, but it was deemed that there wasn't sufficient time to make that happen in time for this school year. 
uh, which obviously begins uh, next week on Tuesday. Uh, so as a result, what we're proposing is that for one year only, and this, this I'm, I'm crossing over, uh, Mr. President, to the next agenda item. I hope uh, you'll give me a little leeway in that. It's right relevant there. to this item. Yes, please. Uh, and uh, so we're proposing that for one year only, uh, we continue the past practice of having this subcontracting relationship with the school district, but that after that time, it is our intention to uh, insist that the school district contract directly with the Sheriff's Department for these services. In recent years, the school district has uh, subcontracted for one sheriff's deputy. For this coming school year, the school district wishes to subcontract for two uh, sheriff's deputies. Uh, rather than the city footing that bill, the county used ARP dollars to foot the entire cost of that additional deputy. And it's those funds that this agenda item would accept from the county for purposes of funding that second additional deputy. The following agenda item would approve the actual one-year agreement between the city and the school district, uh, although I'll note uh, that uh, because of some language that needs to be cleaned up in that item, we are suggesting and recommending that we hold off on approving that agreement until next Tuesday City Council meeting. Councilwoman Rutherford, followed by Councilman Goodman. So shouldn't we be passing a resolution letting the district know that this is the final year instead of us saying that we're going to do it this year? Because if we don't have it in writing, we have nothing to hold them accountable to. I'm certainly, I'm certainly open to that. If, you, if council would like to pass a resolution expressing that intent so that the school district is formally put on notice of that, I'm very open to that. I would note that if that's the council's uh, desire, since we're not approving the agreement, uh, well, we're, we're recommending anyway, the council not approve the agreement until next Tuesday, uh, that resolution could be passed next Tuesday rather than tonight. The only item that we're recommending council approve tonight is the acceptance of the dollars from the Oakland County ARP funds for okay. purposes of funding that second deputy position. All right, thanks for the clarity. Councilman Goodman, Pro Tem Carrington, Deputy Mayor Stevens. So the first thing I want to say is, I, I, is there any time sensitivity in terms of passing the uh, uh, item that we're currently on, Mayor or Deputy Mayor? Deputy Mayor Stevens. So um, great question, and that's actually why I raised my hand, just to give a little bit more clarity. Um, the item that we are currently on is really for the city council to acknowledge the fact that Oakland County has funded this opportunity not to exceed $200,000. So that money does, is not going to hit city books. It's just for you to recognize that, hey, as we go into this next item, these funds have already, this, this bill has already been covered by Oakland County on our behalf. So, so this is for you to acknowledge that so that you know that the residents know you are not being wanton and just spending money because the school district asked you to do so. So with that to council president, I, I really would like to postpone this item as well. because I do not want to get in the habit of uh, writing resolutions on the floor. I, I would like for us to be able to have it in writing before the meeting uh, at any point in time before the meeting. I, I, and not to say that this is a bad thing. I just want to get in the habit and not open that door. Um, so that's the first thing. And then thank you, Deputy Mayor, for answering uh, that question. And to clarify, this is, again, solely just us acknowledging that the county has put forth the money for this. And that's, that is it in terms of this item. Thank you. President Pro Tem Carrington, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, President McGinnis. Uh, I kind of want to speak to the second item since we are discussing both. Would that be okay? No objection. Okay. I guess uh, you guys mentioned that the county will pay for the one research officers, but I was under the understanding that the district would also pay for that second officer, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct, sir? Deputy Mayor. So not only is that correct, that's part of the language that needs to be cleaned up. This this document has gone through multiple iterations. Um, 
And what was left out of this current one was the expressed um, overall cost of the program and a, a written expression that this much of that cost is on the school district, this much of that cost is on the city, but also the part that is on the city in saying that that part is being paid for by the grant or the appropriation, I should say, use a, a correct terminology, the appropriation from Oakland County. So there were changes that were made um, and the attorneys are, are still saying, yes, that's in the right place. No, that's not in the right place. So, oh, Thank you. No further questions. Do you still need to be on the speaker's list or are you good? No. Councilman Nichols? Will the further cost of overtime be included? Yes. Okay. That, that, that is, that is um, a current sticking point as to how to allocate overtime. Great. Thank you. I hear my colleagues' concerns, um, um, but I, I do think that it's really just symbolic, um, the vote that we'll take that's before us now, that essentially acknowledging and, and the receiving of the up to $200,000 for that second uh, liaison officer. I do want to acknowledge Oakland County Commissioner Angela Powell, who sponsored this resolution with Oakland County government. Um, my understanding, and I could be wrong about this, is that Oxford High School um, in the recent tragedy that they experienced, the county um, took the step of spending a one-time uh, sum so that they had an additional liaison officer as they went through their trying difficulties. And uh, Commissioner Powell was able to convince a majority of her colleagues uh, to say that Pontiac has unique challenges when it comes to safety of our schools as well. Um, so it's welcome resources, and I think, it's, I think it makes sense for us to be able to help facilitate that because really what we're doing is we're just facilitating the county being able to, to do that since we're the ones with the contract with the sheriff's department. Um, but I hear Councilman Rutherford's feedback, and I'm going to try and craft that for next week as well um, so that way we can just be clear and direct so that um, the, our counterparts at the school board and, and the school district administration understand um, because this particular action is a one-year gig. This is a one-year situation. But next year moving forward, they always have the one officer, at least, that the school district entirely pays for. But there is not a need for us to be that pass-through necessarily. Mm -hmm. that's, our, that's our perspective. Councilman Rutherford? Um, uh, Deputy uh, Mayor, can you make sure that um, in the language when you write it up that it says clear that we do not pay for overtime so that it can be no, no you know, I mean, confusion? Absolutely. So it is the desire of, of the body as a whole that the city will not pay for any of the overtime of the two officers. That's it. Pro Tem Carrington, you have the floor. Well, I'd definitely like to see the contract before I make that dis decision. Um, because right now we just have a contract in front of us, so I, I just can't make um, mm -hmm. just calls out loud without seeing a contract. We're not Councilwoman James. And we would, well, yeah, I, I'd like to see the contract as well. And we we definitely don't want to give the county back any money. They're, they're allocating up to $200,000. So I'm not sure whether that is, is going to cover the salaries only or if that would uh, allow us a certain amount of money beyond salaries that could possibly be used for overtime. We need to use that two hundred thousand dollars. Is what I'm saying, you know. So, however, it's to be allocated. We definitely need to utilize it. Council in Rutherford. The problem is, in the past, we've paid for overtime. The city has. That's why I want to in writing that we're not paying for it. That's what my issue is. With it. I don't want us to start to have a contract. We get it signed, and then we end up paying for overtime we can't afford. We don't have enough community liaisons in our community right now. I understand they're going to give them two, but I, we can't afford to pay for overtime. We can't. That's it. Councilman Parker, Deputy Mayor Stevens. One question. I noted that it has one park patrol vehicle, cell phone, mobile radio, all that. So that means they're going to give an additional one or take one from what they already have. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll start with, with, with that question. Um, the the liaison officer will be equipped with all of the stuff, the liaison officers 
will be equipped with all of the equipment that they need to be regular officers. So that is what is included in an officer. Um, the Does that answer the question? No. Is it two vehicles? There should be two vehicles. And all, I, this, uh, and all the equipment. Okay. Correct. Because they're, they're separate. Each officer... I just want to make separate. sure they're not taken from us to put over there. No, no, no. So that actually, so, okay, now I understand the question better. So that is the whole purpose of having um, this specific contract is that it is saying we, the city of Pontiac, are going to go to our contract with the sheriff's department and specifically say we want two, two additional officers. One of those additional officers, the cost of which is being covered um, by an appropriation from Oakland County, which was secured by um, Commissioner Powell. The second officer, the school district, is saying that they will pay for completely. Um, but because it's in the contract, we are obligated to provide those officers. And if you notice, um, actually, I think that's something that was changed in the language as well. The officer that is being contracted is what is called a um, fill officer which means that if that officer calls in sick, then they will actually send in a new officer. Whereas if, a, if we did a no-fill officer, if that officer called in sick, then they would not send a replacement officer that day. Now, a fill officer costs more money than a no-fill officer. But again, there's an appropriation from the county to cover that. Does that now answer? You answered it a while back. Okay. I, wanted to, I just wanted to make sure that I was clear. Um, and then... <laughs> And then to uh, Councilwoman Rutherford and Councilwoman James's points. Um, so again, there is an appropriation that was done by Oakland County not to exceed $200,000 to cover the cost of one officer. And that, that is all of the cost of the officer. So the overhead of the officer, um, that would include the overtime of the officer. And the contract is written in such a way to say that the city of Pontiac is not coming out of its own um, pocketbook for this activity. Everything that we do as part of this agreement with the school district has to fall inside of the cost that has been appropriated by Oakland County. Councilman Nicholson. Uh, the, that's great. Yeah, I think as strong as language as we can put there, I think will be the best. Um, I know that when we approved the um, uh, the sheriff's department um, contract, that the officers for the city were no fill positions. Although, of course, they have minimum man minimum staffing that they have to adhere to. Um, I'm hoping that maybe the separation of the contract could help even any of those opportunities where we have to say, this person called in, let's take from here and put over here. Uh, you know, clearly minimum staffing happens, but we're, we're, we are allocate our, our contract allocates us above minimum staffing so we want as many people as we can but to take one off and put one over um right i think if there's separate contracts that sort of helps us give a little bit more of a leg to stand on too That's right. and saying please don't take our downtown officer and put them at the school district because or wherever you know the so, case yeah, may so be. That, someone that, from that traffic enforcement or whatever the case may be any further discussion on the motion before us which is to receive the uh, and acknowledge the Oakland County Appropriating American Rescue Plan Act funds um, as it relates to the police school liaison officer program agreement. Hearing no further discussion, speakers list is exhausted. Roll call and adoption, Clerk Doyle. McGinnis? Yes. Yes. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James. Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carried. The resolution is adopted. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution to approve the police school liaison officer program agreement between the school district of the city of Pontiac and the city of Pontiac to authorize the mayor to sign the agreement? Once it's been moved, we can postpone it for one week. I move it. Support. It's been moved by Council and Rutherford, seconded by President Pro Tem Carrington. So that motion is before us, but as we've discussed, uh, there's interest for further negotiation and refinement of the agreement to come before for consideration. So is there a motion to postpone for one week? Move, Carrington. Move. She had a finger first, so That's Councilman support. Rutherford <laughs> moves. It's been supported by Pro Tem Carrington that we postpone uh, this resolution for one week to return at our next regular City Council meeting.
With that, roll call on adoption of the motion to postpone for one week. Clerk Doyle. Parker? Yes. Rutherford? Yes. Carrington? Yes. Goodman? Yes. James? Yes. McGinnis? Yes. Nicholson? Yes. Seven yeas, no nays. That motion carries. It will be before us next week. We are now at public comments. Uh, President Pro Tem Carrington, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, all. President McGinnis. Quincy Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, or whatever it is. All right. Our council person's actions last week did not reflect the desires of our districts, of our district one with regard to conduct. It is our hope that in the future she will reflect on her behavior and refrain from embarrassing displays such as we saw regardless of the mean-spirited, provocative comments from certain citizens. A couple of things. Last week, the Oakland County Sheriff's Department got their chance to explain their actions regarding Ms. Wilson, a mentally ill Pontiac black woman who was, who was pummeled by two Oakland County Sheriff's Department deputies. We believe the actions were premature, which leads to excessive force. Despite the scattered and often discombobulated, disjointed, and I must say in some instances duplicitous remarks by command staff, it is clear had they not jumped her as quickly as they did, she would, they wouldn't have gotten bitten. Our position is not that police were wrong in responding to the call. It is the aggressive methods used to remediate the situation. Our per position is not so much anti-police as it is anti-police procedure. For instance, if you look at almost all of the incidences with uh, Freddie Gray, Philando Castile, Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, way back to even Malice Green, and the list is endless, police acted quickly, aggressively, and prematurely with black people. You see the trend. No one says that police are not needed regarding criminal behavior. But the actions of police with black people historically and contemporaneously have been criminal, thuggish. Uh, it's been a thuggish enterprise which has resulted in our being murdered, brutalized, framed, humiliated, illegally incarcerated, and traumatized. These are facts. The instances of unarmed black people being killed by police are regular occurrences, and we can't deny that. It's in the news every single week. All we are saying is that the aggressive, impatient response by police, the propensity, the proclivity to act quicker, more severe to black people needs addressing. It needs to be acknowledged. It needs to be addressed. Now, today, Biden, in an in a address uh, that he made earlier, was talking about giving more money to police. I'm certainly not for defunding the police, but I'm not for overfunding them as, as well. Uh, that money could be spent a lot of more ways than giving more money to police. Police, there's no statistics that prove that more, po more police get rid of poverty, get rid of all of the things that go into, uh, uh, into crime. Crime occurs with people who are more poor, who have less resources. And so money should be spent better than arming more police with more Humvees, more AR-15s, more paramilitary equipment, and giving it to situations where, like, for instance, we don't have a community center here. We could put some more money towards that instead of more money for police. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Ms. Renee Beckley. Tim, you should have fired those deputies that beat that woman. Now, it's a matter of time that someone here may die. I guess you will have a George Floyd situation in Pyatt uh, before something's done about it. So you let that pass, and then somebody will get killed by one of them. Okay, I'm going to address Councilman Brett Nicholson, because you gave the impression that I said something racist and that I said I can't understand you being that economist here. First of all, that was not me. But somebody over here, and I'm going to regret because I don't know, I wanted the tape back, and I don't know who it is, and I don't think you knew who it was. First of all, I do not say racist things. So, for me, you don't know who I am. You do the Pontiac. So, really, you talking, I don't understand why you said racist. And, um, really, uh, the man said, I bring that portion of Rebecca. Uh, I understood him. He didn't have the uh, report. He was going to bring it back. Even the state that I'm racist, I'm one-fourth white myself. I have a cousin that was married to a white man. I stayed at the house. Her husband's dead now. Two friends I had since the first and sixth grade, both white. 
right here, the city of Pontiac, sat for three years next to a Puerto Rican co-worker, best fun that I ever had. I was friends with people from all around the world. So you cannot say that I am a racist because you don't know me, man. You just got here for yourself from Auburn Hills. First of all, you got to fight your own fight. Don't, when you're a co-worker in trouble, don't take the side of the co-worker that gets you in trouble. Didn't you learn that? Council should be like this, not like this. Y'all like this. Y'all need to be like this, like this. I've seen some go down for bribes. I've seen some that took a bribe and had to get off this council. Y'all going to fall, fall your, co your um, councilmate? Let's think about that. I've been coming here since Walter Moore was mayor. Kathy Kinnard was the president. That's the 1990s. I come the way I come. Y'all do wrong? Y'all do wrong. I don't like taxes. I'm a, a conservative black woman that's a Democrat. Okay? I don't like taxes. All right? I don't like to pay my taxes, but they too high. I'm living in a house by myself. I come here. So do I have to come here every week? I was coming here once a week. I could come here every week. Also, I don't come with violence. But I'm afraid, Brett, you're going to say something to one of these men and they're not going to be as polite. Also, I can go to a law office and get a thick, a, 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 what they call it, a packet this thick, and I can sue y'all. I have First Amendment right. I can say what I like, as long as it's true, and I'm not fretting anybody. Well, I said I didn't fret nobody last week. I was just complaining because she kind of was telling that she was going to file a police report, and uh, we have First Amendment rights to say what we have to say. That's so that's Pucci why I came time. here. Next time I'll be campaigning for your opponent, Brett. Uh, thank you. Mr. Chuck Johnson. That's me. <laughs> okay. You know, I hate to sidetrack my comments, but tonight I'm sidetracking my comments because I don't think, and I love all of you, I, I, this is the best government in the last 25 years, including the mayor. Everybody asks me about the mayor, I tell, I, a, a five-star man, and, and, and including this council. But for the life of me, how can you sit there and say to the taxpayers of this city that we should fix our own sidewalks? We pay taxes in this city. We pay taxes in this county. And you cannot say that we should be responsible for repairing sidewalks. The people in this audience and those of you at home listening to me, go outside and count the flags in front of your house and see how many are cracked or broken. Then you'll be able to take the numbers that was mentioned here at the cost and you'll see how much it's going to cost you to fix your sidewalks and your drive approach. Oakland County, this is a county seat. Oakland County has money that they can spend in this city, but we're not after it because we don't know evidently how to go get it. But there's money that's allocated for sidewalks in this community, and we need to be after it. Not saying to the taxpayers, go fix your sidewalks because they're cracked, or cut down a tree that's going to cost you another seven or $800 because you can't get the sidewalk under it. Okay, next thing. Uh, Mayor Grimo, I would love for you to go over to the substation and push that little button and stand there and let the person tell you what your order of business is. And then you stand there and see how long it takes for somebody to come to the door or pull up in a police car and give you some kind of response. I was over there on several occasions, 10, 15, 20 minutes, half hour. Suppose it's sub-zero weather. Suppose it's 100 degrees outside. Suppose it's raining. There is office space inside that building where people can go inside. If the police department want to bit, get, let the people come in, they can coordinate it off the same as you folks do up there and let the people come in off the street that want to have a complaint go inside and make the complaint. Don't stand out in the parking lot like some second rate citizen. The next thing, Mayor, these sidewalks that are all broke up and busted, if you notice the demolition contractor is not being forced to repair the si sidewalks anymore. When I was wrecking, we had to replace them. Now, these guys come to town, they break up the sidewalks, they drive your truck probably halfway up the street on the sidewalk before they even decide to back into the driveway to tear the house down. You should go back five years on all the contractors who wrecked the house in this city of Pontiac and make them come back and repair the sidewalks in the vicinity that they tore a house down or don't let them wreck in the city no more. I don't have enough time to go into my next comment, but 
I'm like the last lady. I only come down there when I got something serious or so just want to see you find folks' face. But I'm going to start coming back because that's not that fair to put time. that off on the taxpayers. Thank that you. conclude your time. Mr. Durrell, folks. He's not here. Ms. Regina Campbell. She's there. Ms. Gloria Miller. First of all, I would like to say, uh, I want to start with the sidewalks, too. It's just amazing how you guys don't think. Ms. Rutherford, I do agree with you on this. Every household is not the same. Everybody can't afford to fix the sidewalk. Not to mention, we talk about sidewalk, we haven't gotten to the trees yet. I got so many neighbors need trees trimmed. And Renee probably know this. When was the last time we had trees trimmed in the city of Punnett? Was the, wasn't it Walter Moore in office? The citizen has the floor. It's 20 some years. So we got very important things going in the city. You guys too quick to talk about what we can pay for. Everybody is not the same. Believe it or not, we're heading to a recession, they say. So, I mean, think. Come on, think. I wanted to bring up, first of all, I noticed that the issue with the police department is not on agenda. And I don't want to show this on the road because I don't want I'm, 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 I'm going to say what I mean. I'm going to mean what I say. And I'm never going to back down if I think that I'm correct. And when I say that those police officers was wrong for the way they did that lady, they're wrong. But if you notice, this lady's in jail, being prosecuted and getting ready to do some time. Mm -hmm. And I said last week when the mayor wasn't here, so the mayor's here tonight. Mr. Grimo, you have authority, according to the, uh, the former mayor, and she confirmed it. You have the power to displace those officers, at least put them somewhere else. And I think that will calm this community down because it's going to get worse. When you sh you have a tendency to rub over things, you don't take care of it. It just get worse. It get worse, and you lose your credibility, and the people don't have no faith in government. Because what we see on that video, I don't care what color that lady could have been. She could have been white, Hispanic. It was wrong the way they beat her. Three men or one woman. I don't care if she was high. She couldn't have beat them. She was too little. And so I'm 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 just going to say. It is on you, Mayor. It's, she is correct. It's in the charter. You can do this. You can squash all this with Oakland County. Bashar don't work for you. I mean, you don't work for Bashar. Bashar work for you. We pay them $13 million for their officers. And so if the citizens said they don't want them here, I say keep them a job, but put, put them in another community where they can relate. Because one of the officers said they can't relate. When you can't relate to people and you're in a district, you got to either get out of there. You got to get out of there because you can't relate to us. And now I want to say one last thing. I am disappointed in the council. I'm going to say it publicly about what happened uh, last week. A lot of people called me that night and they weren't able to hear the things that we heard in that hall. And for you guys, for the six of you to sit there and do nothing, then censor, I don't care. It could have been me up there because you said the 10th count was the worst. We never got up and called on one of B. And public, public. And all you did was do a resolution and pat on the hand. That ain't good enough. That doesn't that's apply for any of you. You hold, you held to a different standard. It's two pastors up there. That's why I say you don't belong in politics. You got to do the right thing. Thank you, Mr. Bill Maxey. Bill Maxey, community activist hat. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Pontiac, community at large, and governance. I have three areas to speak on tonight. Number one, I'll make comments on what my colleague, my great associate, Mr. Stewart, was saying about training. I know for a fact, I do a lot of research. The Sheriff Department received $150,000 in grant. It went to technology. It did not go to training police. It did not go to buying cameras. When he says something to you, listen, Mr. and Mrs. Pontiac. Secondly, not going to beat a horse to death. Remarks that were made last week. Thank you, counsel, for censorship. I live in District 1. I'm going to go one step further. 51,000 people heard the insults. I want a public apology 
along with my colleagues, a public apology from that podium, that's it. I will know the sincerity when that is done. I am a leader among leaders in this city. And I have to walk to walk and talk to talk. Thirdly, Mr. Johnson, I continually, continually tell you, and he's talking to me about all of the infractions of rules, trucks weighing 20 tons coming down the street, backing up over the sidewalk. They're the ones that need to be responsible for this. To the mayor, to my contractors. I haven't written the, pork, the uh, report yet. I did have a meeting with Mayor Grandma. I appreciated that meeting, integrity to inclusion. There are a lot of obstacles, but I understand this, that you have to, he's replacing those who don't want to walk in the cadence and make sure that integrity takes place first. On Tuesday night, when this gentleman stands up here, counsel, more emphasis on how many home base minorities and inclusion always has a reason I don't know and I don't believe. I stood at this podium and said, I don't know, nobody told me so. But <clears throat> we're working on that. Again, but as long as I'm in this city, I have breath, and I am one among one of the many leaders in this city. And again, we're going to look at that council, ask that question, inclusion, over $3 million so far, the former mayor had over $20 million in contracts and less than 0.1.5. That's terrible. So again, you know, we're moving on, we're watching, we're documenting, I document everything. Everything I said here tonight, I would not double talk. That does conclude your time. Thank you. You're not 51, 55, so you can't talk to me. Alas, I am 38, and the time is the time. Ms. Veronica Taylor. First, I give honor to God who's the head of my life. And I am an evangelist. About to be a pastor. I come to talk to you all because I have a company called Hard Working Mom Service where I take care of inmates locked up around the world. Around the world. I got 19 calls about what happened. And they say, you the Oakland County Precinct Delegate. You help get these people in office. And why do I do that? I help get people in office to help bring home people from prison. I try to be the bridge to help bring home our lost children. And to say that, yes, I help put a lot of people that in council, up in the council, by the grace of God. And I am a little hurt that one of our precinct delegates that get voted in like you all do, I got over 350 votes, and that's not even in my district, how I got this precinct delegate. Let me tell you, as a precinct delegate like Renee Beckley is, that walk and carry lit, walk from door to door to help people, to have any councilman like you all to disrespect them, that is too much. And to say that because I really care, we do not get paid. We do that out the grace of our heart for the grace of God to make change for this country. Now, I don't care about <laughs> being recognized because, see, God recognized me all day long because I do his work. I help put people in office to bring change for our lost children, for God. And for us to sit up here in this council and disrespect one another in this city and say, we just had Bishop Lee to pray here in this city. Y'all gave her something. We talk about one another here in Pontiac because as I leave Pontiac, I hear about the stuff that y'all say about me. So let me explain something to this city of Pontiac. We got a voting going on. If we can't come together as one and stop backbiting one another, trust me, just like you got voted in, God will vote you out. And I'm asking this council, if you can make resolutions for other stuff, you all need to make a resolution, not for me, for Re Renee Beckley, because she has been doing the job for this city for many, many years. And Mayor Grimer, before I, my 26 minutes up, 
We have an organization here in the city of Pontiac called Life Beyond Reentry. And I can't even get a door uh, uh, invite me into your office because they say you work in the political world. I am a resident of Pontiac and to be disrespected and I vote all the time and I push for vote. I need to get into your office to have a private conversation with you. Your time. Thank you. Mr. Larry Jasper is not present. President McGinnis, that concludes our public comment. All right, we are now at discussion. The first up is Youth Recreation, update regarding Youth Recreation Center and location. I'm pulling up the image that I think you want us to have since it was on the, the desktop of the computer for presentation. Mayor and Deputy Mayor, you have the floor to start the discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, President McGinnis. Uh, we have uh, been diligently looking at a variety of potential locations and different approaches to delivering on the promise that was made to Pontiac residents uh, four years ago now to build a youth recreation center. Uh, we are strongly committed to developing a community center that will house the youth recreation program. Uh, and we have uh, looked at uh, an enormous number of sites in the city. We've winnowed that list down really to three finalists, and I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Mayor Stevens to run through those three possible approaches to this, the pluses and minuses to each of them, the uh, rough estimates in terms of cost of each of those three approaches, and we're really uh, eager to get some sense from council as to the direction council would like us to move in. That doesn't necessarily mean a formal vote this evening, but some informal direction from council about which of these approaches you'd like us to pursue would be very, very helpful so that we can go down uh, that avenue in uh, uh, quick fashion to make sure that we're bringing an actual agreement before council uh, that relates to one of these approaches for council's actual vote. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Deputy Mayor Stevens to talk about the details of the, the possible uh, approaches here. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'll start with the uh, graphic on the screen, and I will um, actually start by apologizing to the entirety of the public. Uh, after I created this graphic, it was brought to my attention that even though the graphic focuses on the three sites that we reviewed. It does not show the entirety of the city. I was, I was trying to make sure that you could clearly see the sites, and so it doesn't show the entirety of the city. But um, if you look at the graphic, what we're looking at is what I call the Montcalm loop. So Montcalm, which becomes MLK and also becomes um, Cesar Chavez, if you look at it, it creates a loop around the city and um m59 which is huron street is also is approximately the center cut of the city so what we were doing is we were trying to stay inside of that center cut loop of the city as we were looking at properties and so the three properties inside of that uh loop that we really really dove into were the Wisner site, the McCarroll School site, and the former YMCA building. So the former YMCA building is, for those of you who don't know it, is right on the eastern edge of the Woodward Loop between University and M59. The McCarroll <coughs> School site, for those of you who may not know it because uh, McCarroll has been closed for so long, is on the north central um, part of, of that loop. And it is right close to um, our park systems. And then the Wisner site, which is still a very active site, people still walk at the Wisner track, is of course on Cesar Chavez on the west side of that loop. So you have one property that was 
all of these properties are centrally located to the city. So one property is on the central west side of the city. One property is truly centrally, centrally located. And one property was located um, centrally. Um, well, I would say it's, it's central, central as well. It's just to the southern half of the um, boundary. So those are the sites that we really dove deep into looking at. We, we worked with three different engineering companies, and we also worked with an architectural firm. The architectural firm we worked with, we sat down with them and we said, we did a space needs analysis. So we went through all of the bells and whistles that we would like to see at a community center. We talked about the gym space. We talked about having a, a, a covered pool that was available all year long so that um, not only could residents have a place to go and recreate, um, and potentially even you know enjoy doing the summertime, but also so that our schools could once again have uh, a competitive swim team. I, I, I do wanna say that I personally am a little bit biased on that because that was my first varsity sport in high school and I did in fact have a swimming and diving scholarship. So I am really <laughs> pushing the pool aspect. Um, but that, that, is, that is something that we, we really did um, want to make sure, and that is actually something that the school district has said that they want to also provide, and we will talk about a potential collaboration with the school, with the school district as we go on. So we talked about uh, gym space, pool space. We talked about the need for multi-purpose spaces. We talked about the need for the ability for this to be the first step of a larger project, so we're not just talking about youth recreation, we're talking about recreation in the city of Pontiac, making sure that our seniors have a place, our youth have a place, that um, the members on the council who are not yet seniors and no longer youth have a place to go in the community. So just a community center in general and all that comes along with that. And so as we looked at these three locations and we worked with that um, uh architectural firm, we determined that approximately 58,000 square feet is what we would need for, for all of the bells and whistles in the building that we would like. Um, we got an estimate of, of building that space. One second here. We got an estimate of building that space to be around $16 million. None of these buildings or, or locations is going to cost $16 million to acquire. However, when you look at renovation costs of these buildings, estimated renovation costs of these buildings are anywhere from $8 million all the way up to $16 million. Um, and that, that really just depends on which, which, architect, which architectural firm you're, you're dealing with and uh, what is the estimated cost of materials for the day? Are they a union shop? Are they a non-union shop? And um, the actual size of, of the three different buildings that we're looking at. And so given the fact that even if you were talking about just renovating a building at the lowest estimated cost of $8 million, we really believe that it would be a best case scenario for us to do as much of that construction as a new construction as possible. Um, when we look at the YMCA building, that building we actually ended up not recommending to go further on for a few reasons. The first reason is it's the smallest of all the sites. Um, the second reason, so when we talk about total land area, it's the smallest of all the sites. The second reason is the building itself even when we're talking about renovation costs and being able to renovate that building for approximately $8 million on the low end, $16 million on the high end. Yes, the building has a pool. The pool that it has is not um, competition size and the pool deck is not um, built in such a way that you could actually have spectators come. So if the high school wanted to use that as their school pool, that would be insufficient. So, even though the, the amenity is there, the amenity is not there in such a way to actually be a true amenity for the community. So we, we crossed that um, particular property off. Uh, there was more than just that. Uh, the, the gym spaces that are there, do not ha they're not um, ADA accessible. There's no elevator. Uh, additionally, the, the spaces that are there are not air conditioned. And 
So there's a lot there's a lot of additional work that needs to go into that particular building. So we took that building off of the list. That left us with the Wisner site and the McCarroll School site. The McCarroll School site uh, is nice because it is truly in a neighborhood. Uh, all sides of that property have houses surrounding it. The McCarroll School site is nice because it is on over six acres, which allows us to um, not only have that first phase, but to have additional phases. That means that we can actually see that full scale community center on that site. A potential drawback of the McCarroll site also exists um, at the Wisner site, and that is you do have a historic building there. So you, you have the original McCarroll School, but you also have additions to that building that were um, um, added over time. So we would need to make a decision. Are we going to save any of the building? Are we only going to save the historic part of the building and demolish the um, additions? But whatever our decision, you do have some bones that are there that can actually be um, reused. One of the experts that we consulted with, their bread and butter of work is actually renovating um, buildings. And I will tell you that his answer is always, if you have a building that has a decent foundation and decent walls, you should renovate that building. Um, we had another expert that we spoke with who said, and I believe that we put it on here, that if if building your building, if renovating the building is 60% or more of the cost of building a new building, you should build a new building. Just because now you're actually talking about getting exactly what you want as opposed to making concessions. An example, again, being the YMCA building, um, there's a pool, but that pool is not um, conducive to actually providing the amenity that we want. So you should, if, if you're looking at 60% or greater, you should build a new building because that way you can actually get the true amenity that you want. So that's the McCarroll site, the Wisner site. The Wisner site um, is probably our favorite site from the standpoint of it is 21 acres. It gives you the largest flexibility to actually bring a full community center um, to the fore. It is next to neighborhoods, but it is not surrounded by neighborhoods because obviously on the other side of the building, you, you do have the railroad tracks and you do have some um, industry right there. Also, that, that particular site, the existing school, the historic school has already been renovated and you know, could be moved into immediately. Uh, issue, a, the largest, I won't even call it issue, the, the item that we have to face with that site is that that site is not currently actively for sale. It is currently leased by Lee Industrial. And so Lee Industrial was one of the companies that we worked with as we did our review of all of the different spaces that we looked at. And they actually suggested that um, they would be interested in leaving their lease in order for us to um, move into that building. Leaving their lease, who is the owner of the building? The Pontiac schools are currently still the owner of that property. And so the Pontiac School District has not, and I need to stress this very clearly, the Pontiac School District has not said, hey, City of Pontiac, we want to sell you that building. We're interested in selling you the property. No, the Pontiac School District has simply said, that's interesting. We will talk about it. That's it. Um, so that is what we've gone through. Um, so we have two sites that we think merit um, much further discussion and a potential price tag. So uh, the speakers list is open now. Um, President Pro Tem Carrington had his hand first. But if I could just initially, what are you truly looking for just open feedback? Because when I'm reading this, I see that there is a time deadline on one of your two finalists. And so I'm trying to ascertain yeah. where, what are your ultimate needs and what's your timeline that you're contending with. And, and if you don't object, I'll give the floor to the mayor first just to be able to answer that. But you are still first on the speaker's list. Yeah, we, we can. So a couple things. We, we can certainly share the listing price of the YMCA and the McCarroll School uh, location if, if 
city council is interested in that, and that's essentially public information because it's uh, listed prices uh, for uh, those properties. Obviously, that's not possible with the Wisner School because it's not actively for sale, as has been mentioned. What we're really looking for tonight is ideally some consensus from city council. And again, I, I know consensus is uh, a, a loose word, and I'm intentionally using a loose word, but some sense from a majority of city council as to city council's preference. And that could be you know, hey, we, we prefer the McCarroll site, we prefer the Wisner site. It could be we prefer the YMCA site. I mean, we, we have concerns about it because it's not new construction and we're somewhat constrained as a result in what the center would ultimately look like as a result. Uh, it also could be we don't like any of these three sites and we think there's some, some other site. Now, what that site is would is a little bit would be lost on us unless it's a currently city owned site um you know if folks have questions about any specific uh sites feel free to ask those sites uh we've reached out to i think virtually every you know this might be overstating it a little bit but to almost every owner of former schools for example and uh, most of the, the former school buildings are in really tough shape. Um, in some instances, we didn't hear back from some of the uh, owners of schools or they said they weren't prepared to show us the school, which we did not take as a, as a good sign. Um, so, uh, but feel free to ask about any other specific locations, but it would be nice to have a sense from, from a majority of council as to what direction you'd like us to pursue. President Pro Tem Carrington, you have the floor, followed by Councilman Rutherford and Councilman Nichols. Uh, thank you, uh, President McGinnis. Actually, um, I think, you know, for me, Wisner or McCurl School would probably be um, a good fit. But I just want to, um, I guess we need to find out the acquisition costs from the district. And if you have some preliminary concept of uh, talks with them concerning this, uh, some kind of acquisition costs. Uh, secondly, uh, would you plan on building where where the, the Wisner School is, or do you plan on building where uh, the track is or, or that land outside of the track? It's 21 acres. It's, it's definitely a beautiful location, and it's centralized. Now, on the flip side, McCurl is in the 6th District. <laughs> <laughs> Order in the chambers. But I'm, I'm, I'm a fair person. So, But I definitely need... Of the city to kind of look at more of the disadvantages and advantages when it comes to costs, because I'm really concerned about long-term costs to the city, and how can we continue? How can we maintain either one of these uh, long-term? Uh, so I definitely want you guys to take that in consideration. Uh, will we have the staff of capabilities or capacity to maintain something that big? Uh, will we be able to keep it clean, cut? How old, what would be that cost of maintaining? 21 acres, or even six acres. Yeah, that's it for me. Councilwoman <clears throat> Rutherford. So I have several questions. My first question is making sure that it is feasible for all sides of towns to get there. So that's the only reservation I have with Wisner. How are we going to deal with that? Because Wisner is located on Cesar Chavez. Then we currently have issues with the bus line. We also don't have a way for the kids to get there. There are no schools located over there. So wouldn't McCarroll, only because of where it's located, be more sensible than Wisner because of the center, because of the location of it? That's my first question. Well, this is our feedback time. so. Okay, so um, I'm looking at it from both aspects. If we get the 21 acres, do we? what's the timeline that we're going to actually have the conversation with uh, the school district about how much they're actually going to sell us the building for? And is Lee Industries going to actually, um, do we have it in writing with them before we even go talk to the district that they're going to actually, uh, not, not revoke, but um, uh Resend their offer that they have on the building. I guess that's the question. I'm sorry, I'm talking to you. Could you answer the question? Just you, you. Thank you. Yeah, so Mayor, yeah, yes. You've been yielded to. Lee Industrial has has um, indicated that they will um, allow a, that they will vacate their lease. Okay. And so my other question is, what because there's a time sensitivity on the McCarroll's building. Um, is there any way we can extend it so that we can get an extra two weeks to be able to talk to the school district about Wisner? 
Because we don't want to lose McCaro by default and then be stuck with Wisner and then we don't get Wisner either and then we're still in the same ballpark with no community center. Yeah, your point's well taken because – I'm, I'm sorry, You're President. Mayor Grimal has the point. Um, your, your point's well taken. Um, the school board president, I understand, is uh, probably not going to be available for a conversation with the superintendent until next week, for example. And so um, we – would likely need a little bit of additional time. Uh, I spoke with the owner of the McCarroll School site uh, personally and got the the time we did get because uh, that that itself was uh, putting off a potentially imminent signing of a purchase agreement. Uh, but I'm happy to to have a conversation with them about whether we might get some additional time uh, as well. And so I'm certainly happy to call him tomorrow and have that conversation. Whether he'll be willing to give us a little bit of additional time, uh, I can't say for sure. All right, thank you. Councilman Nicholson. So uh, my personal opinion, I agree that McCarroll's location is um, prime, especially I like the adjacent park space. Um, I am nervous the thing that makes me nervous about it is uh the school district's position with w with whrc and all of the construction that's gone on there and had a very viable general contractor give them uh, you know what it's going to take and now we're in the position the school district's in now with not being ready for school and having a, a tremendous amount of work that still is yet to be done um so without like a really great um review of what's going on in that school. I mean, who knows, right? The, uh, some of our schools have had clad walls for years, have been added onto, have been, you know, who knows what's behind those walls every time and the amount of remediation that would meet, need to be done to um, makes me nervous. Of course, Wisner, we know, um, is in a, in a much better, more stable condition. I'm, I'm the thing that makes me nervous about Wisner is just its pro proximity to Webster. Um, with all of the community activities for youth that will be going on at Webster, I do think that puts uh, a good amount of activities just because it is within maybe a mile and a half. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and just thinking about that, yeah, I do love the, the location of McCarroll, if we could figure out the exact condition and what it will take for that building. Um, but Wisner, I think, is a, a, is a great option. Um, otherwise, I'm just um, uh, nervous about uh, putting so many resources in one general location. Councilman Goodman. So the first question I have is uh, related to uh, well, the overall concern of centrality and uh, ease of access. So is there any way possible or any conversation that could be had in terms of possibly uh, getting a bus route or rerouting one in a way that goes closer to uh, the Wisner site, site, if that is chosen, because with McCarroll, for example, like the nearest bus line of that is on Perry. That is not that is not the longest walk in the world, so that makes it a very good situation. And Baldwin, while still within a decent amount of distance for someone like me, it is not a thing in which I would want to send uh, the elderly, anyone with any uh, physical ailments or disabilities, or children just walking over a larger area when it's easier to have them much closer. So that's my first question. Is there any been any thought process in terms of improving transit for access to that site? Do you yield to Mayor Bremel? Yes. All right, yield it. Well, you, you read my mind, Councilman, because um, you know we wanted to get a sense tonight about, about general direction that Council's interested in moving. But to me, it's really essential that a community center be on a bus line. And although the smart bus line comes close, because I believe, and you follow these things closer than I do, uh, Councilman, but I believe the bus does run up Cesar Chavez just so far as Baldwin and then north. Uh, so I think it comes close. Mm -hmm. um, so my hope is that with a conversation with SMART, we could get it to run further northwest along Cesar Chavez uh, to that location and then maybe have it come, come across Montcalm uh, to Baldwin and then north or something like that. You know, we'd, we'd have to talk about what those logistics might look like. And I will say not to go into the fine details, the only thing I'll say to that is the importance of having the bus go along Baldwin is because the shelters are right there. Mm -hmm. So if you go that way and then cut across Montcalm, you're completely cutting out the 
the group of people who would need it most. But I digress. That isn't just an important conversation that we have to have if that site is chosen. Yeah. Um, and then can I ask a follow-up question? Yes. Uh, so and, and from what, I'm, what I've gathered, there has been no serious conversations with the school district in terms of acquisition for the Wisner site. And with that, it kind of, like, again, goes back to the other, po other point of we don't want to – uh, postpone and wait for that site when uh, McCarroll is right there and we can jump on it and again have the opportunity where we have neither of them. Yep. So uh, I mean so do, do you ha have any sense of the direction in, yep. of the school district at all on this? Well I, I think we, we have had a conversation with the administration at the school district and the administration is very open to the possibility but of course the administration is not the final decision maker the school board is and so the administration while being very open to it wants to have an opportunity to really vet the concept with the the school board understandably and rightfully so and they they really want to emphasize that they're they are fully aware of the fact that the administration itself is not the decision maker. So they really emphasized in their conversations with us that it's really a, a conversation that absolutely has to occur with the school board. Um, and so based on where the administration is, you know, I, I think it's fair to say we've had a real conversation with the school district's administration. It's really just a question of where the school board is at and what the terms of any possible sale would be. And those are the conversations that have not yet occurred. Um, so again, sort of synthesizing your point and the point of Councilwoman Rutherford, it would be nice to get a little more additional time with the uh, McCarroll School site so that we can properly uh, weigh those two uh, opportunities. Uh, Councilman Goodman, McGinnis, and James. And so, cause I, again, because it's in District 3, I am very happy that this is even an option. But again, to be fair, um, that's why I'm asking these questions. But I do have a question. I think, Michael, you might be the best person to answer this, or Council President. Um, what are like the historical property ramifications if we choose the Wisner site? Because I don't... How much uh, uh, history would be lost or damaged in the process of this? That's also a concern that we, I have. The Wisner School itself was built in 1911. It is not on the National Register of Historic Buildings. It's historic with a lowercase h. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, there is 13 acres of vacant land, if I've, or maybe it's eight, but the, the vacant land is also owned by the school district between Lee and the track. Mm -hmm. The stadium is actually the most historic in the challenge of what it would cost of the implications of who then has ownership or responsibility for the maintenance of Wisner Stadium because it was built in 1940s with 1940s era standards, which makes it very expensive. Um, so when you're looking at the Wisner School site, you're, there is the school, mm. the parking lot, the stadium, the track, and vacant land. Mm. All of that is owned by the school district of the city of Pontiac and there are various different agreements that they have with Lee Industrial Contracting that's been spoken to um, but there could be the opportunity or the responsibility for some or all of that piece of the puzzle. The school district on behalf of us the taxpayers but on that side can make decisions about what they want to do with the building alone, the building plus the land, mm. the you know, if you're taking this, we're sticking you with the stadium too. You've got all of it. Um, but there are no sort of historic legal requirements or restrictions because it's not on the National Register of Historic Places where you're required to only do X with that building or even for that matter the stadium. There's nothing, there's no sort of U.S. Department of Interior where they're looking on that. And that's true for McCarroll School as well. It is not on the National Register of Historic Places. And so my follow-up question to that would be, uh, it d I know the building got renovated by Lee Industrial recently. Uh, I guess the, the, the main point is, in choosing this site and doing a construction, uh, how much history realistically are we losing, if any of, and I hate to say of substance, but of substance? There are three floors inside the interior of the school. Uh, 
within the last decade, uh, very thorough um, restoration has been done. There was even a modification of the southern entrance, so it looks the most new, where directly facing uh, the, the parking lot. The lower, all three floors are beautiful and operational, a kind of set up almost like classroom or office styles or, or public open styles. Um, I, I can't really speak to sort of what history, I mean, it, it was a school in operation for 100 years. Uh, it, it definitely looks historic and feels historic when you're in it mm -hmm. and outside of it, but already the building has been partially modified mm -hmm. to make it so that there's a modern entrance. Okay. Uh, thank you. So that's, a, that's all I have. Uh, so I'm next on the speaker's list. Uh, what I enjoy about the McCarroll site is how close it is to multiple large park lands that the city already has in its control. Uh, we have already made the determination that Oakland Park will have a substantial recreational boost by the new skate park that will be there. Um, but I think that a, a viable youth recreation site allows for both indoor and extor recreation all year round. Um, so I think that's a priority. Uh, my concern is about where we are in the timeline. And based on what information is provided, I almost feel like we've been, this will be inflammatory, but we've been Deirdre Waterman. Um, if you look about the golf drive site or even before that the Wisner school site where you had like days to make a very consequential decision. So I understand that's not the position you're trying to put us in, but we have a very definite deadline where the McCarroll site, if that were to be one of our finalists, is, is teetering on the brink of not being available anymore. Um, I think that to pro tem Carrington's point about viability long term, I, I don't think we necessarily want to be in the business of trying to go down the rabbit hole of spending all our money on trying to bring McCarroll into the 21st century or any other very old building. Um, but I could see the value in demolishing that site, um, demolishing that school and the annexes, and then being able to put, and you tell me if it is contiguous or not, it might be standalone, but in close proximity because it's across the street from Oakland Park. But I don't think it naturally connects with Aaron Perry Park um, uh, along Edison, et cetera. That's, there's some neighborhoods there a little bit, mm. um, but very close proximity. So that way, soccer is, is sites that are available. I don't know what condition they're in, but we have baseball right. diamonds that they did have over there. Skate park is, is, is coming online. There's something there now, but bringing bring up to higher quality. We have how many basketball courts at Oakland Park? Uh, okay. Two or three. Okay. Um, so my concern is that we, we pursue what's attainable and we do it in a way that allows us to expand as resources allow. Because, and you tell me if that, that works well with efficiency of cost, but if we're able to either have a fallow site or we demolish and create a new site where we can build a new youth recreation center that has a realistic footprint but then has the ability to expand as the you know federal funding is able to be secured I, and I'm grateful that the administration's been thinking about how do you capture some of the American Rescue Plan dollars of the county to match what we're going to uh, pursue presumably with our American Rescue Plan dollars partnered with the three million plus dollars that the previous City Council uh, has already earmarked and that's that's sat there for this purpose that we could have sort of phase one of the youth recreation center that can then be added on as resources and, and community interest allows that if we try and do it all at once there might be some economy of scale there but if we're if we're going where we want all the bells and whistles we want that recreation Taj Mahal it might prevent us from being able to get there in a realistic time frame that I want to talk through that more because those are big implications about money but also about utilization. How, how quickly can we dial that up? And I know you've been considering what's the, what are the sites that allow us to begin doing youth recreation there quickly and then be able to scale up. But th that's where kind of some of my initial concerns are. But I appreciate you taking into consideration where we are geographically with the whole city. And I think that we want any recreation 
facility to be able to be a multiplier effect, that it can stabilize neighborhoods, it can improve our existing park spaces, it, it will be beautiful for, a, a, you know, if seen from a major thoroughfare, that we can have a lot of benefit beyond just the recreation benefit. I think that wherever site we end up, even if it's something that, you know, a rabbit out of a hat that we haven't considered, that we could try and leverage our SMART funding because they kind of have those community dollars that, you know, depending on uh, where the will of the people is in the, in the very near future, but that if we can try and creatively create something, neighborhood connector shuttles, because I'm thinking about mainly youth using that or youth with maybe, you know, uh, a guardian or, or, or a parent accompanying them maybe for the, the trip there and back. But if there can be some sort of connector shuttle that doesn't necessarily have to be handcuffed to the existing smart bus route or the bus route plus some, that, again, we'd have to work through the logistics of it, but then allows it to be more accessible wherever it is. And I see those issues with any site. Uh, obviously, the YMCA is literally almost like in the center in terms of just out of downtown. But if it was there, I'm thinking about what's around it and how, how could that complement youth recreation? How would that feel like an attractive destination for children, you know, on foot or being dropped off? That I think that I, I like the concept of the recreation and green space opportunities so that way they can be integrated together for the generations to come. And that's certainly true with Wisner and, and for pull, full public disclosure, many people know just south of that is Oakland County's Historical Society of which I am the executive director, um, so I'll work to not, you know, that cuts both ways, I'll work to not have that be a factor in my decision, um, but there is a lot of benefit to Wisner already being a place where recreation happens for the community. There's just not em enough current facilities that work for a year-round operation without a lot of reconfiguration. So my main question, I've gone in a lot of directions, but I'll yield now to the mayor or deputy mayor about are you thinking for McCarroll that we're talking about acquisition, demolition, and then are you thinking about doing the whole, you know, ideal, um, top-notch, full facility, new construction, or were you thinking of keeping that structure, doing some, you know, salvage, band-aid stuff, adding, or it'd be like, you know, what are, what are you looking at? And I know that you are here getting our temperature, so I'm throwing it back at you that I'd like some temperature back specifically for that site yeah so you, you've hit on a lot of yeah. important points I'm sorry that's how my mind goes no that's a good thing um, first of all it was certainly not our intention for, for you or for us to sort of jam us up on this time frame with McCarroll we we have visited McCarroll a couple of times in in recent months uh, and we were I don't know if surprised is the right word but but a little surprised that he was he had this opportunity and we we just learned about that several weeks ago so we've been kind of scurrying to we knew this was coming up and we've been scurrying to try to make this happen and we didn't really know the time frame uh but we knew that he was talking with somebody and then we learned that the time frame was pretty imminent and asked him to to wait a little while so that's how that evolved we would rather frankly have more time and we'll certainly seek some additional time with with him, as I indicated earlier, um, you know it's it's interesting because the it, just in terms of location and centrality in the city, and and it's actually a little south of the of the true geographic center of the city. But just in terms of the geographic centrality of the location, my preference would be the YMCA site in terms of the centrality because it's close to downtown. It's really south central in the community. Uh, and the other interesting thing about it is it, you know, if you had a checklist of items, you know, pools, gyms, multi-purpose rooms, it sort of checks all those items. The concern is the quality of some of those spaces, as, as the deputy mayor mentioned, in terms of the pools. You know, it's got a couple pools, but one of them doesn't work. The other one probably works, although it hasn't been used in a little while. But they're not, it's not laid out, the pool space is not laid out in a very functional way. The pools are relatively small, even the larger of the two. And the building layout is, is somewhat awkward. Um, and there are a lot of walls, you, you need to really reconfigure the building. The other problem is the, 
constraints of the site itself. And, you know, the owner of the YMCA building does own some of the houses on Seneca Street there, on both sides of Seneca Street there. So one could perhaps put a deal together that would buy a larger parcel than just the YMCA parcel. That would be divided by Seneca Street. You you could cul-de-sac Seneca Street and try to have, so it doesn't extend all the way south to University Drive, so that you'd have one larger contiguous property. These are some of the things we've been thinking through. But even then, it's it's a much smaller site than either of the other two locations. And we agree, Council President, that we want to allow room for growth. We want this to be a site that can grow over time. Uh, we also are cognizant of President Pro Tem Carrington's point about future maintenance costs. And whenever one's dealing with an older building, even if you put in a new HVAC system, which would almost certainly be required for the YMCA building, there are going to be aspects to that building that even after renovation are just older and need and have some challenges with upkeep. It's true that the larger the site, including Wisner, with the stadium especially, there are additional maintenance costs there as well, and so we're cognizant of that. Um, but the McCarroll site, you know, really is two, for, for all intents and purposes, really is two separate buildings. They're connected, but really two distinct buildings. The older, I guess, 1920s era a school building, don't quote me on that decade. You probably know for sure the decade, uh, President. But then there's an addition that was built, I guess, in the, the 50s, maybe the 60s, that um, is is really a distinct building. And that building really doesn't provide a whole lot of value. There's a lot of classrooms there, but it's in tough shape. There's not any real historic value there. It's not a particularly uh, aesthetically attractive building. There is a combination multi-purpose room slash gym, but it's in really tough shape. The flooring in there is buckled in places. It's it's in pretty tough shape. I, I think our inclination would probably be to uh, demolish at least that newer portion of the building. The older portion, which you know still you know even though it's in tough shape, obviously, and the electrical has been stripped, it has some some aesthetic pleasing aspect to it because it's it was once a beautiful old building and one can still envision that being the case potentially but that raises questions of cost uh, and so I think we'd, we'd have to explore whether it makes sense to try to salvage that older uh, building or just demolish it um, and that would probably hinge somewhat on, on cost as well um, so you're looking at either entirely new construction at the Minter Carroll site or largely new construction, certainly a new gym, new pools, uh, and some additional multi-purpose room kind of construction. At Wisner School, we'd be looking at some of that. We'd be looking at uh, a new gym or two. We'd be looking at a new pool. The school does provide classroom space. It has some larger spaces that maybe could be used for dance or yoga or, or some other kinds of programming. Um, but, you know, one of the advantages to Wisner is that there is a building there that's usable, at least for enrichment programming, that could be used immediately upon acquisition. Um, I suppose in some sense that's true for the YMCA building as well, which is, you know, there are some components to that site that could be used immediately. Uh, but most of it would need really dramatic renovations, and it might be awkward to try to have both youth participants in the building at the same time that other portions of the building are being renovated. You'd have to figure out how to partition the space to safely accommodate uh, certain people. And McCarroll, there is really no portion of the facility that is currently usable in any way, shape, or form. Now, I, I, having said that, you know, we... Forgive me. Uh, having said that, we could, uh, you know, obviously continue to use some other locations in the meantime. And I, I don't want 
us collectively to make a decision saying, well, we want to go with the site where there's some usable space currently, if in the longer term that's not the right decision for the city. I think it's important for us to make a decision based on the longer term considerations of, hey, what is the right location? What is the right site that allows us to build and add on over time and hopefully have a, a really great campus as a community center that accommodates youth recreation and potentially other community center purposes in the future too. It doesn't have to be totally limited to just youth recreation over time. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, uh, President McGinnis, but it's I'm trying to answer certain components of your question, including how would we likely use the McCarroll School site. I think certainly demolition would probably apply for the newer school and possibly but not necessarily for the older school portion of that site. Councilman James is next on the speaker's list. Yes, uh, my, my priorities would be um, number one, I'd like to see our community center be uh, centrally located in the city. I think we owe it to ourselves to do the hard work to really find uh, a spot that ha is on a major thoroughfare in a central location within the city. Um, and the two, well, the three that we're looking at, uh, to be real honest, I'm not overly impressed with any of them. Uh, Wisner is at least new it's usable right now. Uh, it has some it has some uh, appeal because of that, but it's the location is not the best. I don't think McCarroll's location is really, you know, the best. It's kind of sitting off of Mount Com. Uh, it is near other parks and things, but I just still don't think it's really in a central, it's, it's, it's in a really good location. And I prefer new as opposed to old. I think we owe it to ourselves, you know, with, you know, with the changes in weather and weather and, and everything. We owe it to ourselves to build an energy efficient building and something that looks to the future and not to the past. So new rather than old and centralized uh, by all means, you know, it, it should be a, pla a place where you say, oh, the, the community center is, oh yeah, I know where that's at, you know. It sh I don't really want to think about it being off to the side. And McCarroll is kind of like off to the side of uh, Montcalm, not sure, you know, how we would how we would do that. Um, yeah, looking at at the options, I, I still think you know it's it's we've got a ways to go, and I don't know whether or not you guys looked at. Um, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I I've, I've always thought that Martin Luther King Boulevard, you know, when you when you drive down the boulevard and from the boulevard you can see Longfellow, which is it's not facing Martin Luther King, but all of that property from Martin Luther King all the way to, As or I think that's Astor Street or something? Correct. That uh, Longfellow is on, that's, that's very, and that's very nice property and I'm wondering I've always thought that if, if we could get all of the property from Martin Luther King all the way to the back to the school, that would be a very centrally located site for a community center right off of Martin Luther King Boulevard. So, I mean, it's just a thought. Yeah. But, uh, but, but my, my preferences is a central location, new as opposed to old. I don't even want to think about renovating a, a school. I'm serious. I don't even want to think about it. I don't think that's the option for us right now. I, I just don't think so. Not for what we want, you know, in a community center. I think we want new as opposed to old. Now, I realize that's going to pose some problems because, you know, we, we need a building. 
we're we're a city with a youth program and no building and i understand that but uh, we've got to figure out a way to do it uh the mistake in the previous administration was just you know doing things out of you know uh feeling that you you didn't have anything else you could do and i don't want us to get into that i would rather you know if we have to find interim solutions let's do that and let's pay the cost for interim solutions but let's make the right decision for right now yeah mayor grimo councilman parker council in rutherford well i, w I want to first say that I, I strongly agree with you about the importance of a central location. So that's really been uh, a key focus of us as we've looked at potential sites. The you know some additional sites we looked at incidentally were the uh, the old First Baptist Church and then Salvation Army site and now the Erebus Escape Room site downtown. That's an existing building again. Uh, and it has certain space limitations as a result. It also has a site that's relatively limited in size. Um, so, you know, we, we looked at a lot of different places. Um, you know, centrally located is a tricky term, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. if you look at the map that Deputy Mayor Stevens provided along with his men, uh, the memo, I mean, in some, in, in sort of the literal sense of centrally located, it, the McCarroll school site's probably about as centrally located in the city geographically as they come. I mean, you look at it and it's about equally located from east to west and from north to south. So in some literal sense of what centrally located means, meaning in the dead center geographically of the city, McCarroll school is it, frankly. Now that, but having said that, you know, there are other considerations that play into centrally located, like, well, where do people actually live? Maybe most importantly, where do young people actually live? Mm -hmm. uh, bus line access, for mm -hmm. example, but also perception. I mean, and perception doesn't necessarily line up with, and perception's important here, because we want it to be in a location mm -hmm. where everybody in the community can feel invested in. And so just because something may literally be in the dead center geographically of the city does not mean it's centrally located in a cultural sense or in a community buy-in sense. So I'm, I'm sensitive to that. Um, the, you know, the, um, the Longfellow school site, I, I think, is decidedly on the east side of the city. And, you know, it's, it's not in a literal sense in the dead center of the city. Uh, but it is relatively close to uh, the M59 Expressway, a little south of that from uh, from the M59 Expressway on uh, MLK. Um, now, I don't know that there's a bus line on MLK currently. I don't believe there is. Um, and so that would be a problem, whereas at least there are bus lines on Baldwin and I believe Joslin that would allow for uh, fairly easy access to the McCarroll site. And as we discussed, modifying some of the, the, the bus route uh, would allow for the Wisner School to be accessible as well. I mean, it is genuinely difficult to look at a site large enough to really accommodate future growth that is centrally located in the city and check some of the other boxes. So. You know, it's, you know, we looked at, you know, if, if we, we didn't actually uh, tour the Longfellow school site, of course, that is a school site. So like other school sites, it raises the question of, do you utilize the school building and renovate it as part of a larger complex or do you demolish it? Those are really the, the two, two uh, options with any school site. Um, the McCarroll school site, the older school building, is pretty limited in size. So the thought isn't that it would be the primary uh, location, but would be sort of a, an annex to the larger main community center if it were to be kept at all. Um, but um, and you know the reason, the, maybe the main reason it would be kept is out of some sense of of historical preservation in the case of McCarroll. Um, 
But I defer to brighter historical minds like President McGinnis to weigh in about whether that makes sense in this context. Um, but again, it doesn't have to be preserved. You could just demolish it. Um, the Because I think fundamentally we agree with you, Councilwoman, that the bulk of the community center should be newly built because that's the way that it's really going to best serve the community's needs and desires if it can be custom designed and custom built for the community. That's one of the, the main concerns we have with the YMCA site is that it's just not possible. Well, you could demolish that, I guess, but then you've got, you're left with kind of a limited site in terms of dimensions. But the, if you try to renovate the YMCA building, you're really limited in designing it in a way that really benefits the community in the way the community deserves. I mean, people have been waiting a long time for this, really a couple decades, frankly. I mean, even going back to when there were four community centers, those community centers were old and they were outdated. So really the community has not been well served by a state-of-the-art community center in many, many decades. That's the sad truth here. Councilman Parker is next on the speaker's list. Thank you, sir. Can I ask, oh, I got three questions. How much are we talking about spending? So the high estimate is the $16.2 $16 million. .2. Because what I've heard is we, we're sitting here debating Two properties that we don't know the cost of yet because if if we looked at McCarroll it says it needs to make an offer and if we're looking at wisdom the school hasn't even decided they want to sell it yet well with that may I mr. president oh, oh I missed something well do you want to ask your question and then yield question then yield question then yield or three questions and then yield you know, I'll ask my question and yield if I okay. could sure well said, well he's already asked the one which was how much you're looking to spend but we don't know what McCarroll would cost because it's still up for grabs, I'm sure. No, we, we know the McCarroll price. The McCarroll price is fixed. He's not looking to play one buyer off of the other. We know what the McCarroll school is listed for. I believe that price is 600000 but don't quote me on that. You would know for sure, Deputy Mayor. 650 we believe. But again, don't quote us on that. But it is a, it is a certain amount of money that is set as to what we would have to pay to acquire the site. That we know. Okay. Now that's not the case, to your point, with Wisner. Right. Um, because ultimately there's some question as to whether the school board would even be interested in selling it. And I'm more prone for the McCarroll site because even that site offered us a lot more visionary opportunity to develop it to be what we are looking for. Plus, you could put new there, which would be better, because I'm always, having talked to a couple of architects in my lifetime, they would always tell you it is cheaper and better to always build new than try to renovate old. Because even when you renovate old, as the mayor has said, there's always, when you renovate old, you always bring old problems with you, and that's always going to be an issue. But if my buck would go with, let's see where, where McCarroll is and develop that site. And I'm done. I did, but I changed my mind. He answered them. <laughs> Councilman Rutherford is next on the speaker's list. Okay. Um, number one, we have people that have been waiting in this city for years for a youth center, so we can't just say tear something down and then rebuild it. That's not what we promised when we got into this office. We said that we would have a youth center. The, the easiest way to go is to make sure we get Wisner because it has more acreage and, it has, and it's in a location that everybody can benefit from. What I don't understand is, is that the building with Carroll is going to take how much to re renovate it, Tim? I'm sorry, I can't hear you because everybody's talking. Could you, could you answer this question for me? Uh, how much does it cost to renovate? Well, we... we I would say this. I would say that it's mostly tantamount to new construction. Okay. Because so. the only portion that we would even consider renovating is the old school. Um, and the that that would be a relatively small percentage of the total footprint. The old school is very limited in, sky, in size in terms of square footage. So if we were to go and get an uh, agreement with Wisdom, we would have – a place right now where we can have all of these programs that we're already running in addition to the 21 acres, correct? May I, Mr. President? Yes. Um, the, w 
Yes, but I want to. I just one caveat. I mean, depending on what you mean by all the programs, because so there's, there's not a usable gym at that site, or but and we are offering programs that can be only be run in a gym. So aside from those programs, uh, the answer would be yes. So when it comes to enrichment programs that utilize classroom space or smaller multi-purpose room space, the answer is yes. Okay. So then my my third question is. Uh, isn't there a church we're currently using for basketball programs that's right around the corner from, uh, well, actually right down the street from, if I'm not mistaken, that's Pastor Tober Church. We're using that church right for the summer. Well, that's not right. It's, it's, I, it, you may be referring to Dr. Garrett's church, Hopewell? Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, that is, uh, I think we are utilizing that for some programs, and I don't know exactly which programs offhand. Um, we do have our youth rec manager here. Uh, Ms. Taylor, why don't you speak to what programs are being operated out of Hopewell? Because it is, as the councilwoman has mentioned, in close proximity to uh, the Wisner Stadium site. Good evening. Good evening. Um, the program for the summer, it was a part of the camp and STEM. Uh, that's what was utilized for the summer program, but not for the fall programming. Okay. And so my last question, because I may not get to ask this again. Isn't there a church that's almost that's, that can be used in a gym facility? Let's say we got Wizard. Couldn't we use a church temporarily that's right around the corner? I believe it's four or five different churches around there, if I'm not mistaken. Well, we are talking about Pontiac, so there are four or five churches around the corner from just about anywhere in the city. So, right. yes. Okay. That's all I want. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my buddy. My buddy. Councilman Goodman's next on the speaker's list. I do want to interject one question and one thought. For the McCarroll site or the Wisner site, um, we don't have to be limited in thought or in reality based on where something is placed in relation to the street now. So does the McCarroll site, do they own the land that goes up to Montcalm? Or is it, is it just a parcel that's, it's okay if you don't know that off the top yeah, of your head. Yeah, they, they do. So they own north to Montcalm. Uh, that much I do know. But, and by the way, I did not, I neglected to answer one of your other questions, which is, does their site abut Aaron Perry Park? Mm -hmm. And if you look at a map, as I did while sitting here, you, the answer would appear to be yes, the but, but, the, but it gets complicated because part of what the map suggests is part of Aaron Perry Park is uh, the um, the uh, old community center there, uh, the Howard Dell. And Howard Dell is now privately owned. And we did, by the way, approach the folks who own Howard Dell, too, so we had a conversation with them. Uh, but the So it's unclear from the map where the boundary lines are of the private ownership of Howard Dell. But in any event, it is in very close proximity to Aaron Perry Park, if not right across the street from it, and it is in right across the street from Oakland Park. Does anything stop us from building new construction in Aaron Perry Park for youth recreation? Would that ex exacerbate a park deficit? I, I don't. We we would want certainly to be safe and have a conversation with the DNR about that, and we have had some conversations with the DNR about the park deficits, and we know just the person to go to and try to get that answered. My guess is no, because it would still be used for essentially a park purpose or recreational purpose, so I don't think it would exacerbate a park deficit. Um, so that would be uh, an option. I mean, that's the one place that we have internally thought, you know, if we were to use city-owned property, it would probably have to be a existing city park. You had mentioned uh, previously about an assessment study that was done for some of these viable sites. Does this memo represent some of the outcome or recommendations from that assessment? Yeah, I'll defer to Deputy Mayor Stevens about that because he certainly is more familiar with the assessment than I am. Yeah. So I, I would say that the, the memo represents that in the sense that you only saw the three options in the memo, right? So the memo specifically did not talk about the, um, the Ewalt Center because the Ewalt Center is just at, in a position that it is not a, a viable option for um, renovation. So it was, it was just not considered. It is also very much outside of that central arc where we were trying to stay 
inside of a specific identified geographic area to the point that was made about, you know, what is central. Um, the Longfellow School is outside of that central area, but still close to central. Um, there, there are other properties yeah. that one could think about that also are outside of that area, but close I, to I, central. I would, before Bishop Lee leaves, uh, note that we did give careful consideration to her church location because uh, it is a large parcel of property, and it is the old Boys and Girls Club on Columbia, but it's not very centrally located, frankly. I mean, it's it's really uh, in what I think is fairly described as the far northwest uh, area of the city. And so that was the, the main concern uh, that we had or hesitation we had with that property. Um, so I did just want to note that since I noticed that, that Bishop Lee was, was getting up. And so just as the Ewalt Center and Galloway Lake Park more broadly are in the far northeast corner of the city, um, the New Birth International site, the former Boys and Girls Club, is pretty far northwest in the city as well. So those were, were um hesitations we had with that sorry to interrupt uh deputy mayor but before bishop lee left i wanted to make note of that so go ahead no no so that that honestly um sums up so the those are contemplated but we didn't spend time talking about them because they had already been um decided that they were not going to be potential recommendations i do want to acknowledge that there was previously a study done when a pre the previous city council was p pressed with these same considerations and so some of the sites you invoked, including the Ewald Center, uh, a cost analysis was done in that regard as well. So this is sort of like a, a building up uh, upon that. The speakers list is Councilman Goodman, Nicholson, and James. So I, I will, uh, I guess, bring up a couple of things while I'm like this, uh, talking this out. Um, I mean, personally, I, I believe that the Wisner Stadium site is probably the, the better one in terms of space and expansion. If we're trying to do a like full service community center like the way that I somewhat in my mind see the one that exists like kind of like in Farmington Hills and the amount of space that that uses and kind of the the full service wraparound idea that it's good to have more space for that um, and personally I feel and many of my residents feel that district 3 is a very underserved side of town especially when it comes to parks and recreation having lost a lot of those things that migrated south and to the other side of the city um, so I think that's an important thing. And also I do want to point out that putting a larger state-of-the-art community center that we have these large dreams for in the middle of a neighborhood also kind of does create problems down the road if we do it successfully. Because if we have any larger events, we have to recognize that that has strain and effect on local area traffic, especially people who are residential. Um, when it comes to noise and those types of things, it is a very residential tight area right there. Um, and also with that same notion, it being on Cesar Chavez, if the Wisner side is picked, Cesar Chavez being a more major road, in the off chance that we have larger events, whether it be uh, for the city itself or for the schools or for whatever reason that we uh, allow a different team to rent our space, that road is much more conducive to a, a better flow of traffic. Uh, in my opinion, than having it right in the, in the center of a neighborhood. Um, and then also I want to point out that, like, um, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, there are there uh, other improvements that are happening in Oakland Park in the near nearby time besides just the skate park? Not as yet, you know. Just the skate park. Recent improvements were done in the last three plus years. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, the horseshoe pit was redone. The playscape was redone by community organizations as well as the basketball courts. And so I, I think a, a, a very in, important thing is we're talking about uh, its proximity to a park. That park, at least in my mind, should be one of the city's priority parks, uh, regardless of not whether you know from this point forward. So I think an important thing also would be doing is putting some of more of that uh, recreation ability on a side of town that doesn't really have it while continuing to, to build up Oakland Park the way that we're kind of already beginning to do. That way it becomes a very full service park that offers many amenities uh, while also having the, the space and the, I guess, like re really reasonable location for what we're, I think, all envisioning as a full state-of-the-art 
uh, like real uh, sta statement piece for the city. So the, the, those are my comments on that. Councilman Nicholson. Uh, two questions. The, I know we talked about Parkland, but sort of in the opposite um, thought. But I'm wondering with the acreage that's at uh, Wisner, if Wisner was chosen, could the expansive track area could we, could that be designated as a park and then potentially used to help the deficit? And then could we then unlock some of those ARP dollars that we had for that intended pur purpose? We, I, I would want to check again with the DNR um, before totally committing to what I'm about to say. But based on the one conversation I did have with the DNR, and based on some conversations with Kristen Wiltfang at the county who operates in this space a fair amount, it would seem that public entity to public entity transfers cannot be utilized mm. to address a park deficit. Mm. And since the school district is a public entity, it probably sure. would not help. Yeah. Then the second question is um, with the um, construction potential, I know we're looking at that building not having um, I, I, why I'm bring, coming back to this is I'm changing my mind as we continue to talk. I'm moving further and further and further away from McCarroll. I just get this like money pit feeling in the bottom of my stomach that in three years we're going to be sitting here saying we need another $20 million because we've dug into this issue or staffing issues or whatever. With construction opportunities at, um, uh, at Wisner to address some of the, the amenities that Wisner doesn't come along with. Have we looked into, because I just was at Oakland Yard, um, and they use dome-style build. This is in um, Waterford Township off of uh, Huron, um, off of M59. Um, they have uh, a large, their main building is more of like a industrial pole barn type constructed building. Maybe but then like behind that... PAE's... Um yeah, facility. similar, yeah. And then beyond that, they have two large domes um, that are built there. One of them is a very large track, indoor track area that has, um, a, I believe, a soccer field in the middle of it. Um, and then they have a, um, uh, the second one uh, has courts, basketball courts inside of it, so they can be used year-round. Um, I've seen them also with pools inside of them. I know we've not had the best of luck with that type of material, um, but I, in talking to um, the ma the rental manager that was there, not sure whether or not they have all of the facts, but they talked about how efficient it was with heating and cooling. Um, so I wondered if that dome-style opportunity has been explored. You yeah, I yield. Mayor? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, to so that, that that type of construction has not been s specifically explored. It's obviously uh, a much cheaper construction. So whatever number we have, we know it will be less expensive than that. Um, the other thing that I would say is, yes, you have existing structures on the sites of um, Wisner and McCaro. Um, and even though it's not on the list, it was brought into the discussion, Longfellow. But um, I would say be less focused on the building and more focused on the location. Because as was already determined, it sounds like city council is saying, hey, yeah, we get it. Building was built a uh, 100 years ago. It has some historic value. But if we're not required to keep the building... We're just as happy to tear it down and see a brand new construction. So, yeah. so it's, it, it's the cost is what my concern yeah. is, right? The demolition cost, just adding on top of that. If if we didn't have to demolish, and we already have, and I get there's other opportunities where we're currently running programs, but if we had an opportunity to run programs in a structure, some maybe offsite until we can be very thoughtful and strategic in how we add and how we add down the road with new facility, um, I think. Uh, yeah, I would sort of change my vote if you're keeping a tally. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Councilwoman James is next on the speaker's list. And then what we could do after the speaker's list is exhausted, which it can still keep going, is we could take an informal poll and see if, if there is a strong leaning one or the other or a none of the above, which is a viable choice as well. Councilwoman James? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up uh, Ewalt again. Uh, I'm wondering why it was eliminated 
simply for the fact that it was too expensive to renovate when we really want to, you know, ideally have a new building. Why, why wasn't it considered? Because again, you know, we've allowed the WRC to build multiple buildings that have nothing to do with recreation in that park. And yet we looked at that building and we said, okay, it's too expensive to fix, so we're gonna leave it boarded up. I guess I'm struggling with why didn't we consider the Ewalt Center and the land there uh, as a potential site uh, even for a, a new construction? Because that is our yeah. property. The, I realize it's not in a central place, but one of the real advantages of that spot is that it's right within walking distance of our high school, within walking distance of our middle school, uh, it's within walking distance of the elementary school, uh, what is it, uh, Harrington Elementary School, all kinds of housing um, divisions over there. It has a lot of strong positives. So why didn't we consider it for uh, possible new construction since we own it? We, we did. Um, the decisive reason why we didn't put it on the the kind of final list mm -hmm. was because it's not centrally located as i said earlier now we did weigh against that that it is very close to the pontiac high school and pontiac middle school but uh most young people in uh pontiac frankly, do not attend Pontiac High School or Pontiac Middle School. Mm -hmm. uh, most attend either charter schools or other school districts or ATAP in the case of high school, which, uh, excuse me, not ATAP's charter school, ITA rather, or the ITA, which uh, although is in fact a Pontiac traditional public school, mm -hmm. it is not at that campus where the Pontiac High School is. So we still thought that cent being centrally located was very important and that that outweighed the consideration of the close proximity of Galloway Lake Park to Pontiac High and Pontiac Middle School. Okay. Right. Any further discussion? All right, let's do an informal poll that can help the uh, administration winnow further if you um, would prefer Wisner, McCarroll, which we wouldn't call it McCarroll in the future, but that's what we know it as right now. So Wisner, McCarroll, or none of the above, that's the options. Councilman Rutherford, what's your non-binding? So the non-binding feedback from Councilman Rutherford is Wisner. Councilman Nicholson? Wisner for Councilman Nicholson. Councilman Goodman? Wisner. Wisner for Councilman Goodman is his non-binding feedback. Councilwoman James? Um. Uh, of the two options. You're also able to do none of the above. Of the two options, Wisner, but I'm open to other options. <laughs> Councilman Parker? Uh, I've already said McCarroll. President Pro Tem Carrington? Actually, um, I think that we need to get more information concerning both options. I would like to see uh, both options explored more so we can have some more uh, financial information concerning both. Um, right now, I just don't think it's enough information for me to, to make that, that decision. Deputy Mayor Stevens. Councilman Carrington, price aside, location, which is your preference? <laughs> just location? Yes. <laughs> well, we'll Carol. Okay. And uh, since Purdue School is not on the menu, <laughs> I will um, say that, or the site, the demolished site of Purdue School is not on the menu, I will um, say with the information that we have right now, I would be receptive to Wisner with the asterisk that we're not being gouged price-wise. So that's a very big question mark. Mayor Grimel, Deputy Mayor Stevens. Well, I, I, I would note that we did 
give some consideration to Purdue, uh, just so you know, we didn't uh, overlook that as a possibility. Hey, Longfellow got in the mix here, so difference is that still yeah. a contender. Yeah, well, no, that's right. And actually, Purdue is slightly more centrally located. It's, you know, it's not on a bus line, um, although yet. Well, true. Fair enough. Wait, um, isn't it? I mean, bus runs on Pike, but yeah, yeah, bus runs on Pike. So oh, okay, it just doesn't stop on nearby. Is that accurate? Is that important? <laughs> well, well, that can be altered if the bus runs by it. I was not aware that the bus ran down Pike. Uh, it was it was a change after I stopped walking. I see. Okay, so uh, the other primary concern was there is we believe a substantial demolition cost now that we've we've just said that we're not opposed to that but the biggest concern was the limited size of the site there um, so that was the the biggest concern is just limitations in terms of size of site deputy mayor stevens did you have a hand oh, so i was actually going to ask you the same question of pro tem um, well, similar. So you, you said, you know, Wisner asterisk price gouging, but price aside, Wisner or, um, Purdue. You mean the car? No. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want is for a youth, a non-youth, and a senior alike, if they were either approaching this or leaving this community center, that, that when they look around them, they see something that they are proud of, that they would find joy in, would, would want to you know, actively spend time inside and outside, and, and, and would just elicit a positive experience. And I know that, again, I'm biased on this, but the Wisner Complex offers that. And we could accentuate that, you know, because the downside is the train tracks and you know then there's a little industrial kind of with lead that but that could be landscaped enhanced or you know if there's a giant silver dome 2.0 the dome that we do on the uh well, <laughs> no, no, i don't but, want it you don't have to name it that but it just came to mind that um that that site offers that i can envision it would take a little bit more but there's enough of an expansive site and you could see it from the care of from montcalm that you could make it beautiful and powerful, but I think Wisner already kind of is built in with that more than McCarroll. Um, I don't think the Purdue site offers that. And again, because it's very compact footprint that it would still feel kind of tucked away and re you know sort of surrounded by a residential. I think that another outside the box option if the price wasn't insane is that Erebus escape. If the parking lot was also yours, and if the land that then is on just inside the Woodward Loop is yours, and you could make something that's amazing, you know, that you'd be able to see from Woodward, which would be reconfigured. It would, mm -hmm. you know, it's certainly an outside-the-box kind of community center option. I just don't know if there'd be enough land for it, and you just might have to pay too much of a premium for the vacant, you know, the land that would sort of put together to make that more of a, a parcel. So I could foresee a scenario where if you're a resident, um, you know, youth recreation is the priority, but let's say over the next few years we're able to make this a really comprehensive where there's multiple functions at a 21-acre site that has a lot of significance for the community um, over the last hundred years. If that is done to a, a high quality, that I could see that being a really high caliber location and site. And we would just want to think about the logistics, about how do you make that connect to the south side? How do you make that connect to all the apartments that are at Walton and Perry? Like, how do you make that feel as accessible and useful as possible, which I think will be a problem with any of our sites. I think it'll be a problem with any of our sites. We want to make it as accessible as possible, but I think that it, that, that site could instill a lot of um, excitement and pride in Pontiac residents. For the Wisner School site, it is turnkey in the sense that you could immediately begin using it for youth mm -hmm. purposes and community purposes. And so that might have a lot of cost savings long term, you know, in that transition period. But mm -hmm. there is there exists no site currently that's a, a that is a magic 
you know, rub the lantern and here it's got all that we need. It doesn't exist, that's why it, it, it hasn't been chosen yet. So whatever uh, we pursue, we're going to have to do a lot of multiple years of bringing it to the, the quality and caliber where it can be fully useful. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're making me choose between Wisner and Purdue, um, even though Wisner is outside of District 7 and outside of the East Side and doesn't then solve what we must solve with Purdue anyway, I would choose between the two. I would choose Wisner. Thank you. So that was a non-binding exercise, um, but hopefully it gave you a lot of um, perspective as you move expeditiously. <laughs> Any final conversation on that discussion? Do you have the clarity you need, Mayor and Deputy Mayor? I think we do, uh, to be honest. I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I think there's, you know, some, some trepidation, um, at least the, uh, I think there's some trepidation about price or not being price gouged anyway with the Wisner site. But it seems like a majority of city council clearly prefers the Wisner site, Wisner site over uh, McCarroll. I think that's pretty came across pretty loud and clear and do you have a sense of timing on when should the City Council next expect um, a, a more um, comprehensive next phase in this consideration we are going to immediately uh, reach back out to the school district tomorrow and try to get a definitive uh, timeline from the the school district about when we can get a substantive answer from them and we'll give uh, you President McGinnis and, and President Pro Tem Carrington an update as soon as we get a clear sense of timeline from the school district. Thank you. Any further discussion? With that we move to uh, the next discussion very briefly. Um, there is a 17 year old teenager Anthony Rodriguez, a Pontiac resident, um, 17 years old who's been reported missing, has not been seen since August 24th. He is five foot, uh, two inches tall, approximately uh, 130 pounds in weight. He has a tattoo on his neck, the front of his neck, the letters SMV, and there's small dots and the letters CA under his left eye. Uh, please call the sheriff's office at 248-858-4950. Did I get that right, Tanisha? All right. 248-858-4950 if you have any information about uh, the whereabouts and well-being of 17-year-old Anthony Rodriguez, a Pontiac resident last seen in Pontiac. Um, I think that's almost a week ago, August 24th. Any further discussion? Sickle cell blood drive sign-ups are low. Community support is needed. Last week, the City Council voted to recognize September 2020 as uh, sickle Cell Awareness Month. Our um, Bowens Senior Center, uh, part of the City of Pontiac Operations, has a blood drive September 14th at that center, um, but their signups are very low, and they want to let, let the community know that there's, the support is greatly needed. You can call to sign up. You can call 1-800-733-2767 to sign up, or visit Deborah Findlay at the Bowen Center. Again, that number 1-800-733-2767 to sign up, or you can sign up in person through uh, the director, Deborah Findlay, at the Bowen Center. That September 14th um, would be the blood drive in question. Any further discussion? And then the final item uh, is, it's really a quick heads up. The Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan has a grant opportunity that's specific for Pontiac organizations. And uh, so I wanted to make sure you knew the deadline to apply is September 12th for organizations that work in Pontiac, but you must be registered in their grant system by uh, September 2nd. So if you aren't already registered, you need to register by September 2nd. So this is through the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. Uh, it provides grants to civic, community, and nonprofit organizations in Pontiac. There are three different categories of grants. One, professional leadership development, where they'll support individuals working in those organizations to participate in professional development activities. Grant amount is between $2,500 and $5,000. Organizational development, it's support for small and mid-sized nonprofits seeking to improve 
their just ability to operate. So you could do it in operations, funding and resources, organizational culture, strategy and planning, program management and evaluation, or leadership and governments, and that grant amount could be $10,000. And finally, collaboration development. If you have a smaller, mid-sized nonprofit, if you work together with other nonprofits um, for collaboration development, that grant amount can be $15,000. So that's through um, the Pontiac Funders Collaborative, and that's being administered by the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan. Any discussion on that? That's something that many Pontiac-based organizations have used in recent years. Don't miss out. Don't let that deadline be the reason why you don't capitalize on that. Please let an organization know if they can benefit. Hearing no further discussion, we are now at Council Communications. Canvas Pontiac Art Competition submission deadline is August 31st. Contact Main Street Pontiac or visit canvaspontiac.org for more information. Power Company Kids Club fall semester begins September 10th. Pontiac residents can text 248-253-1522 with their interest. Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence has her coffee hour here at Pontiac City Hall on September 10th from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Councilman Mikhail Goodman is presenting a pullover prevention clinic on Saturday, or excuse me, Sunday, September 11th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at Pontiac City Hall in the parking lot? Yes. In the parking lot of Pontiac City Hall again September 11th, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., free refreshments, free food, free parking, free mechanic advice. You can call Councilman Goodman for questions at 248-758-3015 with any questions. Um, there is free headlight and taillight uh, replacement, um, so that way you can prevent um, unwanted and, and undesired pullover uh, prevention. Spotlighting the history of the Constitutional Amendment granting the women, uh, women the right to vote is September 14th at 6 p.m. at the Oakland History Center on Cesar Chavez in Pontiac. We talked about the blood drive September 14th. The next Pontiac Farmer's Market is September 18th, 1 to 4 p.m., held at Hidden River Plaza, 11 North Saginaw. The Oak Hill Cemetery Walk here held at Pontiac's historic Oak Hill Cemetery is September 18th. Walking tours at 2, 3, and 4, and that's, of course, at Oak Hill Cemetery in Pontiac. You heard reference to the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office Racial Justice Advisory Council. They have their second annual Justice Resource Fair on September 24th from 12 to 2 p.m. at Bodette Park in Pontiac. A flu shot clinic is being held at the Bowen Center September 27th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., of course, at the Bowen Center in Pontiac. And with that, Mayor's Office Communication, you have the floor. Thank you, President. Uh, another reminder that uh, September is Senior Center Month, and so uh, please look for lots of activities and special events at both the Bowen Center and the Ruth Peterson Center throughout the month of September. Uh, in addition, uh, another reminder about upcoming Lawn Chair Concert Series events on uh, September 8th at Charlie Harrison Park at 6 p.m. featuring Gwen Fox. And the following week, September 15th at 6 p.m. at Rotary Park uh, on the south side of the city. Uh, MDOT Town Hall is coming up. We had a couple of MDOT Town Halls regarding reconfiguration of the Woodward Loop. We're having a couple of additional Town Halls coming up next week. The first is on September 7th, uh, Wednesday, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Bowen Center. Uh, followed by uh, another town hall on Friday, September 9th, uh, also from 6 to 8 p.m. at Prospect Missionary Baptist Church on the east side of the city. Uh, in addition, uh, I have another brunch and community conversations with the mayor event coming up on Saturday, September 10th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Ruth Peterson Center. Uh, and then we'll be closing those out with a bang on Saturday, October 8th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Bowen Center. And lastly, uh, my State of the City address will be Thursday, September 29th at 6 o'clock p.m. at the Crowfoot in downtown Pontiac. Look forward to seeing people there. With that, closing comments, Mayor Grimo. 
Well, I, I want to emphasize that uh, we're very sensitive to the power outage that's going on in the city of Pontiac right now. We take this very, very seriously. Pontiac, as we've discussed at previous city council meetings, has had uh, more than its fair share of power outages and is another example of our city being neglected for many years in terms of deferred maintenance and underinvestment. Uh, we have been pushing DTE to make repairs as quickly as possible, uh, as is the case here in Pontiac, but also across Metro Detroit with over 200,000 uh, people without power uh, since yesterday evening. Their priority in the first 24 hours has been uh, public safety and clearing downed active wires, uh, but they have started actually restoring electricity to homes. Uh, the uh, Martin Luther King area south of Auburn was uh, supposed to have been restored by 5.30 p.m. today. I have not yet gotten an update, uh, but as of uh, this afternoon, that was supposed to have been restored as of 5.30 p.m. today. Uh, the west side of the city uh, in the Stonegate area uh, is... Uh, has three broken poles that need to be replaced. They were able to restore some of those customers this afternoon, but not all of them, and continue to work on restorations there. Uh, we expect that restoration uh, will accelerate through tomorrow as uh, DT brings about a thousand uh, line workers into Metro Detroit tomorrow to try to accelerate repairs throughout the region. And they have told us that they'll have 80% uh, of customers who have lost their power back online by the end of Thursday. We're going to continue to push them to really accelerate repairs here in Pontiac because, as I said, uh, Pontiac in recent years has had far too many power outages, and those power outages have lasted far too long. So we're going to continue to stay on top of DTE and push them to make these repairs as quickly as possible. Uh, thank you, Mayor Grimal. At this time, we have council uh, closing remarks. We start on my left, Councilwoman Melanie Relliford. Well, uh, Clerk. Clerk Doyle. I'm sorry. No <laughs> comment, uh, Clerk? I mean, okay. Let's, let's start All with right. Councilwoman. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, today I'm reminded that I sit in the seat, not as Melanie Rutherford, the singer, songwriter, successful businesswoman, that I sit in the seat as a councilwoman. The road I work on daily. I work each day to represent all of District 1, the ones that are renters, the homeowners, the homeless. I represent the street and the pulpit. I simply represent District 1. My question is, what do we do now? For me, I will continue to fight for my district, to be an advocate for our Dunlap, to get it done, to be an advocate for a mental health facility, to get it done, to make sure that my voice can be heard and not be silenced or condemned from a moment and make it into a movement. I will not allow others to define me because I made a mistake. But I will continue to work on being the best councilwoman I can be. That is who I am, Melanie Rutherford, unapologetic. And how did this only happen? It happens when we as a community continue to work together to support each other and to hold us all accountable. Because we all will one day make a mistake on this virus. And I hope that the grace that was shown to me today, that I can give to others. For that, I thank you. Again, I do apologize to District 1 because I'm held accountable to District 1 and to the city of Pontiac, which I love, on what happened last week. I won't apologize again. I'm going to continue to do the work. I'm going to continue to hold myself accountable, and I hope that you hold me accountable too. But we have to get past a moment instead of making it into a movement. I want to thank everybody who came to District 1 meeting on Saturday at the Alley Cat. We had about 20 people there. It was interesting because we bought first-time homebuyer programs to get people involved. We also talked about the budget that we're going to be actually bringing in a couple of weeks about how we're going to spend the ARPA dollars. I think that is important that we talk about the movement and not a moment. The other thing that's most important is that I was able to bless 68 students in District 1 with backpacks that cost over $300. No questions asked. We delivered because that's what we do in District 1. We delivered. I was also able to give up $500 worth of gift cards to parents who don't have clothes for their kids in District 1 because I delivered. It also is important that we say that each time there's something going on in District 1 that we show support to it. For example, there's a CDC meeting on Saturday, September the 3rd. It's going to be at the Oakland Press. I'll be there smiling and shop because I represent District 1. And then two weeks later, I'll be at the meeting with the um, Crestwood Association because I represent District 1. 
At the end of the day, being held accountable is one thing, but being beat over and tired is another. And I will keep doing the work, the work that never gets spoke of, because at the end of the day, it's not what people see, it's what they don't see. And I am a worker, and all I want to do is serve my district. So again, to District 1, I apologize. I apologize. I had a manic moment, but it does not define me as a manic because I'm excited about the future for District 1, I'm excited for the city of Pontiac, and I'm most excited for what I'm going to become, the best councilwoman I can be. And to that I say, good night. Thank you, District 2 City Council person, Brett Nicholson. Oh, sorry, that was, that was a little PS. Congratulations <laughs> on, on the graduation party Thank of Mariah. Thank you so much. Oh Tom no, Nicholson. he didn't change the picture, I apologize, <laughs> I was, a young child and didn't know what I was gesture I was doing my finger towards my younger brother um, I was holding his bottle up and that's where we'll leave that um, I was not enthused to have a younger brother at that point in life but um, what I'd give to have him back today um, I'm sorry um, in district 2 you know we had an excellent district 2 meeting at Goldner Walsh um, and I I really hold on to these meetings all week long and it gives me um, a lot of energy and intention uh, for the rest of my month. Um, because when I go to those meetings, this is a room that is packed, packed full of residents that are insightful and cooperative and respectful and thoughtful and still passionate. That their passion doesn't have to come out as insults mm -hmm. or, or threats or frustration, that it comes out in a way where they're able to collaborate and they come up with ideas and they're excited by them. And then we do these ideas. Um, and I hope that at some point in this room, that can happen too. Um, that instead, that we can come to the podium and we can come to our microphones and we can say, these are our ideas and these are things that we can do or things that I think we should do, not things that we shouldn't do or things that you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. Uh, because I really think that anybody who sits here and does the best job that they think they can do every single week still needs your ideas, still needs your insightfulness and your passion, but they need it in a way that they can accept and a way that they can join in on. Um, and you know what came from that is we had a a week with yes terrible weather, uh, but at 8:30 in the morning when I left for work I saw a DPW crew crews out getting those, those the, getting everything off the street and I cruised by and I said hello and I said thank you and of course I said when are we going to get rid of these barrels and they said you know what we'll make a call right now and see if we can throw them in the truck too. Um, we, you know, earlier in the week, I uh, took a cruise as I do uh, back and forth uh, between Bodet Park. And when I cruised through, that same DPW crew was out there installing new trash cans that we've been asking for. And they did it, and they look awesome, and they've been emptying them every day. And residents have noticed. They've been emailing and, message and text messaging me, let me, letting me know, I just saw someone. And they're so excited, and they're so enthused, and it just continues to compound the energy and the efforts of what District 2 citizens are going to continue to do, um, and I'll continue to represent them every single day. Thank you, Councilman. The Honorable Mikhail Goodman, District 3. <laughs> See, the advantage is you get rid of all your childhood pictures, and the furthest back you can go is 2016. Um, when you start at AMC, like, look at me, all young and everything. <laughs> um, so I, I want to make a very pointed comment this evening, which is the definition of the word censure uh, is a judgment involving condemnation. Second definition is an official reprimand. Uh, third would be a, uh, a statement of disapproval in a formal fashion. Uh, based on the fact that we are operating still by the count, uh, 10th Council's violations and the 11th Council's rules, the action that we took tonight was what was laid out by the 10th Council's violations. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, in terms of District 3, the district meeting, uh, for those of you who heard me mention it, it would be the 7th uh, coming up. It has been pushed back due to scheduling because of the uh, MDOT meeting. So it will be uh, September 12th, which is a Monday at 5 p.m. at the Baldwin Center. And that is uh, the address 212 Baldwin Avenue. Uh, in addition to that, we also have the pullover prevention clinic, which is happening here at City Hall uh, in the parking lot, and that's September 11th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, luckily, I have a very good friend of mine who wants to do more in the community, and he, and because he has uh, long-term mechanic experience and does this uh, type of work to help out uh, low-income people, uh, frequently he wanted to be able to come back to Pike and do something. Uh, so if you have a headlight, taillight, 
and I'm also uh, assuming that blinkers are included in that as well to come out and get that replaced. That way you can minimize uh, your interactions with law enforcement. If you don't need to, it is a, uh, a nerve wracking experience, especially if you are a person of color. Um, and unfortunately, as we've seen, it transitions into other things. So to do uh, everything that I can help facilitate this, as well as his help to uh, help minimize these things, I uh, really appreciate. So if you can come out on the September 11th from 11 to 3 and get uh, your lights checked out, please do. Um, in regards to uh, some issues in my district, you know, there are, uh, I'm aware that the lights are out along Kennett and Baldwin that is being worked on by DPW. Uh, unfortunately, because of our uh, very, very, very aging infrastructure, as well as just some issues with, uh, I want to believe it's DTE in the case of Kennett, uh, trying to work through and really hammer home and try to get those things repaired. But I am on DPW uh, trying to do that. And then also to give them credit uh, to the Mill Dam comment, I, I had an event there uh, on Sunday, and it was nice having a trash can right there where I didn't have to walk too far, and it was empty when I got there. Um, so it was really useful. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that we're moving in this direction. Um, but with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. I know we've been here for a long time. And I'm also happy to consider that Wisner Stadium might be the home of the, the, the new center, possibly. Thank you. City Councilman Kathleen James, District 4. Uh, I want to clarify starting out. First of all, I want to say good evening. Uh, secondly, I want to clarify that I do not support residents having to pay to fix their sidewalks. I did say, though, that in the past that that used to be uh, the, the guideline that residents paid. The point I was trying to make, though, is that our current system of batching these sidewalk repairs uh, is not working because it leaves the resident themselves, homeowners, it leaves them out. And they have, they are the ones that have the concern about the state of their sidewalks, but they really don't have any direct control over what gets fixed first. So I just would like to see a little more alignment with our, our residents, you know, in terms of sidewalk repair. That was my point. I do not support, again, residents paying for their own sidewalk repair. Also, we had an excellent District 4 meeting uh, on Zoom uh, last uh, Wednesday. We had some very good conversation around a number of issues. I appreciate everyone that uh, logged in. Uh, and we are discussing uh, having an in-person meeting for next month. So I will be in uh, the process of trying to put something together uh, for our first in-person meeting next month. But I want to thank all of you who, who logged in on last Wednesday, and thank you for your input. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Councilman. William Parker yeah, Jr. Curious, cause you gonna get District no, oh, wait five. a minute. <laughs> oh, you done stole some. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, that takes me back. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. I don't really have any comments other than to say to be good, you have to be willing to be truthful. And if you're not being willing to be truthful, you're gonna make mistakes. Let's continue to be truthful. Let's continue to try to do the best job that we can do for the city of Pontiac not just our individual districts, but the city of Pontiac as a whole, because the city is what's going to benefit. Mm -hmm. And likewise, we have to keep encouraging each, each other, uplifting each other, and certainly admonishing each other when we do wrong. And mm -hmm. I want to remind everybody that the District 5 C uh, CDC meeting will be September 8th at the Lions Den at 6 p.m. And with that, I'll say good night. And please take that picture out. <laughs> That Thank picture. you, sir. I'm wanted by that picture. <laughs> President Pro Tem William A. Carrington. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> well, oh you, well I'm, I'm just allowing you guys to uh, <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> chatter a little bit. But um, I just like to re, um, um, actually state that We Care Neighborhood Association is having their monthly meeting September the 2nd at Silo Baptist Church on University this Friday at 6 p.m. I will be there as well as hoping that the mayor or the deputy mayor can, can join that meeting 
to meet with residents as well. Uh, again, I just want to throw that in uh, the Lawn Chair Council Series in Charlie Harrison Park. The Great Grand Fox will be there uh, starting at 6 p.m. And I do have uh, one question. I, uh, well, actually, one concern. I want to make sure if we, if you guys plan on um, closing off close to University on either uh, Car Street or, or um, Victory, is that we allow the residents to know that that's what we're going to do in a timely manner. In terms, parking, going, in terms of parking. Uh, also, we might want to talk to Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church, which is across the street from Charlie Harrison Park, and they may consider uh, allowing us to use that for parking. Um, usually when we have things in Charlie Harrison, they allow us to use parking uh, across the street. So if you can, you can check on that as well. I actually think um, uh, my support is for Youth Center. So for me, I, I'm not really concerned. You know, I'm not really con concerned exactly where it's at. I just want to make sure uh, that we have a center that we can be um, proud of as well as one that doesn't put the city in a overly financial bad situation long term. Uh, that's my my major concern in that. Um, I believe in this city. I believe in this city council. I believe in the mayor's office. I believe in the citizens to continue to make um, suggestions to this council. Um, I'm really hoping that we can have some open dialogue, that we can be respectful to each other, um, and continue to uh, make sure the city is the best city to live in. That's why I sit here. I want to make sure that people move to this city, people build a business in this city, and we can raise our kid in this city. Uh, and we, we do that by, as adults, we continue to be respectful to each other. Um, and some of this stuff can be done by telephone, by just picking up a phone. Um, and I'm very, you know, that's really, my phone is open 24 hours a day. Anyone that calls me, they get a, they get a text back immediately or they get a, I pick up that telephone. Uh, so we have to start communicating better with each other and working with each other to make this city the best place we can live in. And good night. Thank you, sir. I'm Mike McGinnis, uh, District 7 City Council person. Uh, I didn't see my picture. Oh, well, let's go back. <laughs> okay. I mean, you didn't see your picture. Oh, yeah, I love that picture. <laughs> it occurred to me I could have also gotten your military cert. You're young in that one, too. I know. Your military picture, too. Uh, so, uh, this, I uh, want to acknowledge that um, Identify Your Dream Foundation in the chambers here last night was presented uh, with $12,000 from uh, Leadership Oakland. Um, so I was pleased to be able to open the, the chambers for them to have a, a non-torrential rain uh, photo opportunity. Um, thank you to everyone who came to the Arts Commission's Lawn Chair Concert uh, last Thursday at Murphy Park. Uh, very, very uh, strong turnout. This is just two shots, um, two angles from it, but really, really good turnout, um, really positive feedback. Um, and the series really has, I think, taken root. Um, and I, I look forward to us being able to have something comprehensive next summer as well that um, people can anticipate and make plans around and make sure that um, it's sort of protected on the calendar. Um, happening in our district is our uh, monthly meeting on September 12th at 7 p.m., Prospect Missionary Baptist Church. Um, last night, um, I want to apologize to one of the property owners in our city because as I was um, checking in on a citizen complaint in our neighborhood, this truck with all this old carpeting rolled by, and I followed them for about a half an hour as they were going along Jesse and Roselawn and Shirley and some dead end streets. And I'm like, I know this truck is going to try and dump this. Mm -hmm. um, so here I am following it all the way to City Hall where they turned in their tax bill. Thank you for paying your taxes on time. Uh, it was a, a new uh, property owner in the district. It's a, it's a landlord situation, but they were looking at other potential properties to buy. Um, but so they claimed they weren't dumping, but at the very least they didn't dump. Um, but that was uh, my excitement. I was able to pick up this one that was at South Edith and Auburn um, that residents had complained about. This is very close to Auburn, and it had been there for a very long time, so it speaks to what um, uh, we have spoken with the mayor, and it's his vision as well, that code enforcement can proactively get that, especially very visible, very close to large, um, busy roads. Um, this is the West Manor site, um, and I was visiting uh, last night there when I noticed the guy who was 
going to maybe dump. Um, but just want to bring to the administration's attention, one, we need a long-term solution to West Manor. But two, more immediately, you could see that the barriers have fallen. You could see the chain link fence has come off of the poles. And so um, it could be a potentially very quick fix so that way the residents don't have to be contend with that. Um, and in this just like one fence that's broken. But obviously the West Manor um, site uh, needs some long-term solutions regardless. So the council is looking forward to uh, updates from the administration on what's feasible. And for your reference, this is from the Willard Street side of the site. Um, residents were complaining about this overgrown bu um, bush, and Mayor Graham, you heard this at our, our east side uh, meeting, um, where it's a visibility hazard if you're turning from Sanford onto Pike. So this weekend I had some fun, and I um, took it down a bit. It still needs to come down more, but at least it's not a, a visual eyesore. I just want to acknowledge we've had the demolition at University and Union. We've had the demolition. This is now all entirely cleaned up. This is like mid-demolition at Sanford and Auburn. And then also the long abandoned church at Michigan and Jesse. That's down to, and the sites look very well maintained now that it's done. So just want to acknowledge and thank. Um, but then still, just as that final PS, we're looking for um, progress on Purdue School for a future solution, as well as um, now that we have that tree trimming contract, so that way the right of way can be cleared um, around the site. Thank you again to the administration um, that this was is now been cleaned up. So what was a, a dump site problem at Auburn and Sanford is cleaned up. And with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Support? It's been moved by Councilman Nicholson, seconded by Councilman Goodman, that we adjourn this evening's meeting. Hearing no discussion, roll call and adjournment. Clerk Doyle. Yes. 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 We stand adjourned at 10.08 p.m. <laughs>